Preface and Biographical Sketch From the Poems of George Murray Edited by John Reed This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Peter Preface and Biographical Sketch From the Poems of George Murray Edited by John Reed Preface A great deal need not be said regarding this edition of George Murray's poems. The principle on which the selections have been made was that the book should reflect the poet's own tastes and preferences. In endeavouring to attain this end, the editor has had the constant cooperation of Miss Alice Murray, B.A. Miss Murray had in recent years been so much with her father in his literary work that she came in time to know his ways of thinking and feeling with knowledge which was brightened by affection. Without her aid the book could not have been prepared, and it is simple justice to say that to her the credit of it in large part belongs. Biographical Sketch George Murray was born in Regent Square, London, on the 23rd of March, 1830, and was the only son of Mr. James Murray, who was for years foreign editor of the London Times. He was a pupil at the school of Dr. J. G. Grieg, Walthamstow House, Essex. There, in 1846, he won his first literary distinction, a prize for the best English essay. Soon after, he entered King's College, London, where the promise of Walthamstow was more than fulfilled. He won the chaplain's two prizes for English verse, original and translated, and the principal's prize for Latin verse. He was also awarded the senior classical scholarship, and was elected associate of King's College, A.K.C., the highest honour which the institution conferred. At Oxford, Hertford College, he was alike successful, among his distinctions there being the Lusby Scholarship and the Lucy Exhibition. A literary venture of his later Oxford years was the Oxford Ars Poetica, or How to Write a Nudicate, which was commendation from the spectator, and was pronounced good by the author of the once popular Verdant Green. Among the friends of those distant years were Dean Ferrar and Sir Edwin Arnold, both of whom Murray had the pleasure of meeting in Montreal long afterwards. The closeness of his early intimacy with the author of The Light of Asia is attested by the fact that a poem of Murray's was published, at Arnold's desire, in the latter's first volume, Poems, Narrative, and Lyrical. This intimacy was renewed most happily when both poets wore crowns of silver. In 1891, George Murray dedicated his Verses and Versions to the friend of his youth. After coming to Canada in the later fifties, Mr. Murray spent some years in eastern Ontario, or, as it was then named, Upper Canada, but it is with the Montreal High School that his educational career has been most frequently associated in the minds of his friends and admirers. Of that institution he had been senior classical master for more than a third of a century, when he retired on a pension in 1892. The testimonial which marked his disappearance from the classes in which he had been so long a familiar figure represented a mere fraction of the multitude of pupils who had carried into the world the memory of his voice. Some of them had risen to rank and influence in the professions, in business, in public life, but whether their position was bright or obscure, they were equally dear to their old teacher, and he by them was equally unforgotten. In the latter part of his life as a teacher, some share of his time was regularly devoted to the advanced classes of the girls' high school, and some of his pupils who proceeded thence to the university did credit to his training in Latin and even Greek, as well as English. During this period Mr. Murray became well known as a writer. He contributed not only to the Montreal Press, but also to various periodicals, from Professor N. Y. Hines' British American Magazine to Mr. Joseph Gould's Arcadia both of which, by the way, had succès d'estime, and may still be read with advantage. It was to the earlier publication that Mr. Murray entrusted his Willie the Minor, a most pathetic poem based on a touching incident related in The Recreations of a Country Parson, of the Reverend Andrew K. W. Boyd, whose initials long enjoyed the favour of many readers. For a number of years the classical works that were sent for review to the Montreal Gazette were put into Mr. Murray's hands, and we need hardly say that his criticism was discriminating, just, and learned. 
Some of the older citizens of Montreal can doubtless remember the literary club, which had its focus on Cathcart Street. Of this club, which had among its members Professor and Vice-Principal, the Venerable Archdeacon Leach, the Honourable Thomas Darcy McGee, Charles Heavisage, the author of Saul, and other men of mark, Mr. Murray was the esteemed secretary. On the day of McGee's funeral, the club honoured his memory by marching in a body to the grave, every member wearing a badge of suitable device. I was not a member of the club, and had, indeed, only recently returned to Montreal, but Mr. Murray, with characteristic kindness, asked me to accept a badge, and that badge I still possess. In the year 1869, Mr. Murray won the gold medal, which the St. Andrew's Society of Ottawa had offered for the best poem on the thistle as the national emblem of Scotland. Mr. Murray had chosen as a central theme in the framework of his poem the legend of the Danes, wounded in their naked feet by the spines of the thistles, and forced by their cries to betray themselves to the slumbering Scots, whose camp they were invading. In apprising the victorious poet of his triumph, Dr. Thorburn, who had been one of the judges, informed him that he had attained no slight success, many of the competing poems being of high merit, and some of them, quote, not unworthy of a place alongside, end quote, the victors. They had come from all parts of the Dominion and the United States. Many a letter did Murray receive from the Scots of the New World asking for a copy of his ballad, or for the legend which formed the subject of it. One such letter from St. Louis seemed to have been written by the secretary of a workingmen's club. He and his colleagues were sincerely thankful to Murray for the trouble he had taken to put them in the way of the information which they had been seeking. How many such letters he received during his connection with the press, it would not be easy to compute. Mr. Murray's service to another society of which he was a member cannot be better unfolded than in the words of Mr. George Isles. Quote, My acquaintance with Mr. George Murray, end quote, said Mr. Isles, quote, began in the autumn of 1876. Three friends of his, the Reverend J. Clark Murray, Mr. J. Redpath Dougal, editor of The Witness, and Mr. Samuel F. Dawson, then the leading publisher and bookseller in Montreal, had formed a literary club, of which they decided that Mr. George Murray should be secretary. No choice could have been happier. As the sole permanent officer of the Athenium Club, he was its life and mainspring. End quote. Having emphasized Murray's unfailing kindness and invincible perseverance in the discharge of his duties, Mr. Isles thus continues. Quote, Mr. Murray's part not seldom lay in spurring a procrastinator to writing a paper long overdue. He was a master of the art of tactful pressure, a pressure without which a literary club is sure to go to pieces. Often, too, I have heard him say just the judicious word which piloted into smooth waters a discussion which threatened to become stormy. So diverse, indeed, was the personnel of the club that, at times, only the compulsions of courtesy kept our debates within bounds." End quote. Having mentioned some of the subjects of papers and discussions, calling special attention to an essay on The Princess by Dr. S. C. Dawson, CMG, ex-president of the Royal Society of Canada, which was the substance of that study, which elicited so much praise from the critics and so charming a letter from the laureate, Mr. Isles refers to some of Murray's own papers, such as Jacques Jasmin and Bacon versus Shakespeare. The Shakespeare Club was another society in which Mr. Murray for a long time took a warm interest, and to which he contributed papers. An active member of that club, Mr. S. M. Bayliss, gave me some time ago an example of the pains that his old friend would sometimes take in supplying or verifying data for other members, even when their views differed tutto mondo from his own. Of his happy connection with the Pen and Pencil Club, evidence lies before me in the form of a letter from Mr. John E. Logan, Barry Dane, who was charged with the task of conveying to Mr. Murray's widow and family the club's resolution of condolence. Quote, the club, end quote, so the resolution ran, quote, desires to express its great sorrow for the death of Dr. George Murray, one of its most valued and beloved members. In addition to this sense of personal loss, which touches so closely many of the members to whom he has been an intimate friend, the club wishes to record what must be a general feeling, that a light of Canadian literature and journalism has gone out. End quote. Mr. Logan added, on his own account, that he considered it an honour to have known Mr. Murray intimately for many years. Quote, his kindness of heart, end quote, he said, quote, endeared him to us almost more than his scholarship, which is known throughout the land, even by those who never came in personal contact with him. End quote. 
Mr. Harry A. Jones, Honorable Secretary of the St. James Literary Society, in enclosing to Mrs. Murray the resolution of deep regret which the society had passed on learning of her husband's death, said that to many of the members the loss was directly personal. In 1882, His Excellency, the Marquis of Lorne, now the Duke of Argyle, after consulting with Sir William Dawson, the Honorable P. J. O. Chavot, Sir James Le Moine, Sir Daniel Wilson, and other men of standing in the intellectual world, constituted the Royal Society of Canada, in four sections of twenty members each. Two sections were composed of men of science, two others were devoted to letters, history, and archaeology, one being composed of those speaking the French, the other of those speaking the English language. Mr. George Murray was nominated to the latter section, being one of the original members of the Society. To this institution Murray presented his essay, with translation of exemplary or illustrative epigrams, on the Greek anthology. Both of his criticism and his version, scholars who were present at the reading expressed a high opinion. We are disposed to believe that Murray cherished the hope of one day seeing his versions of the exquisite flowers of ancient song on which he had expended so much study gathered into a volume. To Murray's exceptional skill in giving English dress to the choicest morsels of French poetry, many readers have borne delighted witness. No one has described Murray's gift more accurately than his friend, Mr. E. G. O'Connor, when he says that he turns French poems into English poems. He had also the kindred faculty, which is not so common as some persons suppose, of recognizing a true poem in another language as well as in English. Without this faculty it would be idle for even the most learned of Grecians to approach the anthology, to extract what is really sweet and sound and fair from that wondrous miscellany, a certain cultured instinct is essential. A great deal must not, a great deal need not be touched. Whole sections may be let severely alone. Having thus made his clearings, the master begins his task, his most delicate task, of transforming Greek verse into English verse, Greek epigram into English, still preserving the poetic flavor. Just a hint of what Murray could accomplish in this genre of the poet's work is afforded by the cluster of English and Greek epigrams in this volume. They are Murray's own choice. In a most sympathetic and appreciative notice of Mr. Murray, which appeared in the Transactions of the Royal Society of Canada for the year of his death, the Honorary Secretary, now Vice President, Dr. W. D. Lesseur, after referring to Mr. James Murray's rare knowledge of languages, said that, quote, From him, his son, our late colleague, may well have inherited the great interest in language as an instrument of thought and culture which through life he manifested. End quote. Then, after briefly recording his earlier career, Dr. Lesser thus summarizes his half-century of life in Montreal. Quote, Mr. Murray's first journalistic connection in Montreal was with the Gazette, for which he wrote book reviews. He also contributed to a number of literary journals, which sprang up successively in that city, and having had their day, ceased to be. A more permanent connection was that which he formed with the Star in the year 1882, when he took charge of the literary department of that paper, including the Notes and Queries, a department which he made famous. Here he had found an occupation which lasted the rest of his life, for up almost to the day of his death he was writing for the Star. His last work appeared in the issue of the 26th of February, and also for the Standard, a literary journal which had its birth in the Star establishment, and which in a manner was brought out under his literary auspices, the company which controlled it, and of which Murray was made president, being called the George Murray Publishing Company. His page in the Star at once won popular favour. His book reviews were fair, moderate, judicious, and often very telling, while in the management of his notes and queries he exhibited a wealth of knowledge and a patience and kindliness in imparting it which were wholly admirable. He was made the arbiter of countless disputes as to modes of speech, rules of grammar, and historical and literary questions of all kinds. Even in matters of which he was not specially master, he would generally contrive to obtain for his correspondents the information they required. The classical master in the high school thus became a schoolmaster for thousands who never saw his face, and so gentle and kindly were his methods that one is led to believe that he must have done much to cultivate a similar temper amongst those who were thus brought within the sphere of his intellectual influence. End quote. Of the many tributes of affection and admiration paid to Murray's memory, one of the most pathetic appeared in the Winnipeg Free Press. It had been written by his true friend, Mr. George Isles, in anticipation of Murray's eightieth birthday. March 23, 1910. 
Knowing that his friend had old pupils in the West Countries, Mr. Isles reminded such of them as were readers of the free press of a building which some of them had twofold associations. Quote, Facing St. James's Club in Dorchester Street, Montreal, quote, he wrote, quote, is the Fraser Institute Library. It was in this plain brick building, only two stories in height, that the high school was formerly conducted. Here George Murray, from 1859 to 1892, was the senior classical master, inspiring a long succession of pupils with a measure of his own love for Horace and Virgil. Many a Canadian now famous at the bar, in medicine, in engineering, dates his zest for literature from the days when he construed and recited under Mr. Murray's eye. Let us pay him our respects which we may easily do, as his home is only a few paces off, at 11 Brunswick Street. He greets us as cheerily as if he were but sixty. On the 23rd of March he will celebrate not his 60th, but his 80th birthday. We have interrupted him at the notes and queries which are to appear in next Saturday's star, as they have for thirty years past. Mr. Murray is a gentleman of the old school, and no interruption such as this affects his perfect courtesy, or chills in the slightest degree the warmth of his welcome. End quote. Quote, we note that he is surrounded by a capital library, its volumes, two and three deep, spread from shelves to tables and chairs. Here is every dictionary in concordance with having, all drawn upon every day for the behoof of correspondents who wish to verify a quotation, trace a couplet to its source, or learn the date of a discovery, a coronation, or other historic event. But much the most valuable store of knowledge for reference here is contained in Mr. Murray's own marvellous memory. Odes and sonnets committed to its tablets in his youth are today recalled as vividly and accurately as if impressed but an hour ago. End quote. Mr. Isles then speaks of the old pupils or colleagues in journalism who had written books and were proud of inscribing them to him whom they delighted to honour. Of such marks of love and esteem he made no attempt to conceal his appreciation. There is one dedication which has carried Murray's name to many households in the old lands and the new, and how sadly one reads it now that both Drummond and Murray are gone from us. Of the wealth of tender memories evoked by the announcement of Murray's death, the most salient attribute was its spontaneousness. Few men or women have been so warmly, so widely loved. Nor was it merely because, as the Reverend Dr. Robert Campbell said, Quote, the whole country was indebted to him. End quote. The bounty of knowledge does not always gain the devotion of the heart. Between learning and kindly simplicity there is no necessary divorce, and yet they are not always mated as they were in Murray's happy composition. He liked to place her gifts and acquirements at the disposal of others. Mr. David Ross McCord, M. A. K. C., did not cherish the enthusiastic appreciation of Murray's qualities, intellectual and moral, without reason, and Mr. McCord spends his life in spiritual contact with the quote, great one gone. End quote. Dr. F. W. Kelly and Mr. F. Yorston spoke of his worth, each as a fellow worker in a department of life's duties. The Reverend Principal Rexford, Mr. R. C. Smith, K. C., Mr. Henry Dalby, Dr. MacPhail, and many others expressed from diverse points of view their judgment of the friend whom they had lost. The Reverend Dr. Simmons, out of a full heart, paid a warm tribute to the friend with whom he had spent so many hours in happy converse. It would be easy to add to the list of Murray's friends whose lips or pen grew eloquent over their silent friend, but I forbear, knowing scarcely where to choose. Not long since, in turning the leaves of a volume entitled Great Hymns of the Church, my attention was drawn to the name of George Murray in a footnote. The author, the Reverend Duncan Morrison, M.A., thanked him for reference to a valuable work in which he found the suggestion of a new and ingenious reading of a verse in the Te Deum. This was only one instance in which Mr. Murray of the Star, Montreal, as the obliged hymnologist qualifies him, was able and willing to be of service to fellow workers in letters, philology, antiquities, and folklore. Some of his replies in his much prized and widely read column, which he began just thirty years ago, were learned monographs that in their way were invaluable. One of the most painstaking of such productions was his Police Verso article, which was prompted by the mistake of a famous painter but it was in conversation with intimate friends that Murray's best qualities were disclosed. If the scene was in his own little study in the midst of his well-chosen treasures, it was indeed a privilege to ask and be answered. George Murray was in a peculiarly felicitous sense what Johnson called a clubbable man. On that point the evidence is large and unimpeachable. But he was also, in quite as real a sense, a domestic, a family man. 
He loved his home, and in his home he was beloved, as few men have been beloved. In 1859 he married Miss Catherine Flora McLaughlin. He lived to celebrate the jubilee of his wedding day. In the retrospect there was much happiness, not without human life's share of sorrow. The second boy, Herbert, was fatally injured in the old high school playground. The eldest boy, Russell, died in the midst of a fairly successful career. The survivors are two sons, Mr. G. William Murray of New York, and Mr. Frederick Murray of Oxbow, Saskatchewan, and four daughters, Mrs. Gordon Stott of Chandlersford, Hampshire, England, Mrs. W. J. Bland of Portland, Oregon, Miss Alice Murray, and Miss Louise Murray. Two years ago, just after George Murray's death, a true friend of his wrote the words, quote, There may be a cypress today within the garden of laurels at number 11 Brunswick Street, but there are early spring violets also, and their perfume will last so long as respect for a great scholar and for a sympathetic heart controls human emotions. End quote. Today we would think only of the laurels as we sent the violets. John Reed. End of preface and biographical sketch. How Canada Was Saved by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia How Canada Was Saved Time, May 1660 Il faut ici donner la gloire à ces dix-sept François de Montréal et honorer leur cendre d'un éloge qui leur est dû avec justice et que nous ne pouvons leur refuser sans ingratitude. Tout était perdu s'ils n'eussent péri et leur malheur a sauvé ce pays. Relation des Jésuites, 1660, page 17. Beside the dark Ottawa stream, two hundred years ago, a wondrous feat of arms was wrought, which all the world should know. Tis hard to read with tearless eyes that record of the past. It stirs the blood and fires the soul, as with a clarion's blast. What though no blazoned cenotaph, no sculptured column tells, where the stern heroes of my song in death triumphant fell what though beside the foaming flood untombed their ashes lie all earth becomes the monument of men who nobly die a score of troublous years had passed since on mount royal's crest the gallant maisonneuve upreared the cross devoutly blessed and many of the saintly guild that founded ville marie with patriot pride had fought and died determined to be free Fiercely the Iroquois had sworn to sweep, like grains of sand, the sons of France from off the face of their adopted land, when like the steel that oft disarms the lightning of its power, a fearless few their country saved in danger's darkest hour. Dolak, the captain of the fort, in manhood's fiery prime, had sworn by some immortal deed to make his name sublime, and sixteen soldiers of the cross, his comrades true and tried, have pledged their faith for life and death, all kneeling side by side. And this their oath, on flood or field, to challenge face to face the ruthless hordes of Iroquois, the scourges of their race. No quarter to accept or grant, and loyal to the grave, to die like martyrs for the land they shed their blood to save. Shrived by the priest within the church, where oft they had adored, with solemn fervor they partake the supper of the Lord. And now these self-devoted youth from weeping friends have passed, and on the fort of Villemarie each fondly looks his last. Unskilled to steer the frail canoe or stem the rushing tide, on through a virgin wilderness over stream and lake they glide, till weary of the paddle's dip, they moor their barks below a rapid of Utava's flood, the turbulent long soul. There, where a grove of gloomy pines sloped gently to the shore, a moss-grown palisade was seen, a fort in days of yore. Fenced by its circle they encamped, and on the listening air, before those staunch crusaders slept, arose the voice of prayer. Sentry and scout kept watch and ward, and soon, with glad surprise, they welcomed to their roofless hold a band of dark allies. Two stalwart chiefs and forty braves, all sworn to strike a blow in one great battle for their lives against the common foe. Soft was the breath of balmy spring in that fair month of May. The wild flower bloomed, the wild bird sang on many a budding spray. A tender blue was in the sky, on earth a tender green, and peace seemed brooding like a dove over all the sylvan scene. 
when loud and high a thrilling cry dispelled the magic charm and scouts came hurrying from the woods to bid their comrades arm and bark canoes skimmed lightly down the torrent of the soul manned by three hundred dusky forms the long-expected foe they spring to land a wilder brute hath never appalled the sight with carbines tomahawks and knives that gleam with baleful light dark plumes of eagles crest their chiefs and broidered deerskins hide the blood-red war-paint that shall soon a bloodier red be dyed hark to the death-song that they chant behold them as they bound with flashing eyes and vaunting tongues defiantly around then swifter than the wind they fly the barrier to invest like hornet swarms that heedless boys have startled from a nest as ocean's tempest-driven waves dash forward on a rock and madly break in seething foam hurled backward by the shock so onward dashed that surging throng so backward were they hurled when from the loopholes of the fort flame burst and vapour curled each bullet aimed by bold or luck went crashing through the brain or pierced the bounding heart of one who never stirred again the trampled turf was drenched with blood blood stained the passing wave it seemed a carnival of death the harvest of the grave the sun went down the fight was over but sleep was not for those who pent within that frail redoubt sighed vainly for repose the shots that hissed above their heads the mohawks taunting cries warned them that never more on earth must slumber seal their eyes in that same hour their swart allies overwhelmed by craven dread leaped over the parapet like deer and traitorously fled and when the darkness of the night had vanished like a ghost twenty and two were left of all to brave a maddened host foiled for a time the subtle foes have summoned to their aid five hundred kinsmen from the isles to storm the palisade and panting for revenge they speed impatient for the fray like birds of carnage from their homes allured by scent of prey with scalp locks streaming in the breeze they charge but never yet have legions in the storm of fight a bloodier welcome met than those doomed warriors as they faced the desolating breath of white-mouthed musketoons that poured hot cataracts of death eight days of varied horror passed what boots it now to tell how the pale tenants of the fort heroically fell hunger and thirst and sleeplessness death scarcely aids at length marred and defaced their comely forms and quelled their giant strength the end draws nigh they yearn to die one glorious rally more for the dear sake of ville marie and all will soon be over sure of the martyr's golden crown they shrink not from the cross life yielded for the land they love they scorn to reckon loss the fort is fired and through the flames with slippery splashing tread the red men stumble to the camp over ramparts of the dead there with set teeth and nostril wide dolak the dauntless stood and dealt his foes remorseless blows mid blinding smoke and blood till hacked and hewn he reeled to earth with proud unconquered glance dead but immortalized by death leonidas of france true to their oath that glorious band no quarter basely craved so died the peerless twenty-two so canada was saved end of poem this recording is in the public domain Willie the Miner by George Murray, read for LibriVox.org by Joe Brenneman. Ghastly and strange was the relic found by swarthy pitmen below the ground. They were hard, rough men, but each heart beat quick, each voice with horror was hoarse and thick. For never perchance since the world began had sight so solemn been seen by man. The pitmen foremost to see the sight had shrieked out wildly and swooned with fright. His comrades heard, for the shrill, scared cry rang through each gallery, low and high. So they clutched their picks and they clustered round and gazed with awe at the thing they found. For never perchance since the world began had sight so solemn been seen by man. It lay alone in a dark recess. How long it had lain there, none might guess. 
They held above it a gleaming lamp, but the air of the cavern was chill and damp. So they carried it up to the blaze of day, and set the thing in the sun's bright ray. Twas the corpse of a miner in manhood's bloom, an image dismal in glare or gloom. Awful it seemed in its stillness there, with its calm white eyes and its jet-black hair. Cold as some effigy carved in stone, and clad in raiment that matched their own, but none of the miners who looked could trace friend, son, or brother in that pale face. What marvel a century's half had rolled since that strong body grew stiff and cold, and youth's blithe summertime robbed of breath by vapors winged with electric death. Many who felt that their mate was slain probed earth's deep heart for his corpse in vain. And when naught was found, after years had fled, few still shed tears for the stripling dead, save one true maiden who kept the vows, pledged off to Willie her promised spouse. Now cold he lieth for whom she pined, a soulless body, deaf, dumb, and blind, but still untainted, with flesh all firm, untraveled o'er by the channel worm. Twas as though some treacherous element had strangled a life, and then ill content, had pitying sorely the poor dead clay, embalmed the body to balk decay. Striving to keep when the breath was o'er a semblance of that which had been before. So it came to pass that there lay in the sun, stared at by many but claimed by none, a corpse unsullied and lifelike still, though its heart years fifty since was chill. But ho, ye miners, call forth your old, let men and matrons the corpse behold. Before the hour cometh, as come it must, when the flesh shall crumble and fall to dust. Some dame or gray beard may chance to know this lad who perished so long ago. The summons sped like a wind-blown flame, from cot and cabin each inmate came. Veteran miners, a white-haired crew, limped, crawled, and tottered the dead to view. Some supporting companions sick, leaning themselves upon crutch or stick, with wrinkled groups of decrepit crones, warily dragging their palsied bones. Twas a quaint, sad sight to see that day, a crowd so withered and gaunt and gray. And now they are gathered in groups around, the dead man delved from the underground. And each stoops downward and turn and prize into its visage with purblind eyes. Mind and memory from some are gone, aghast and silent they all look on. But lo, there cometh a dark-robed dame, with careworn features and age-bowed frame, bearing dim traces of beauty yet, as light still lingers when day has set. She nears the corpse and the crowd gives way, for, Tis her lover, some old men say, her lover Willie, who while his bride decked the white robe for her wedding, died. Died at his work in the coal seam, smit, by fumes that poisoned the baleful pit. One piercing shriek she has seen in the face, and clings to the body with strict embrace. Tis he to whose pleading in bygone years she yielded her heart while she wept glad tears. The same brave Willie that once she knew, to whom she was ever and still is true. Unchanged each feature, undimmed each tress, he is clasped as of old in a close caress. Many an eye in that throng was wet, the pitmen say they can never forget. The wild, deep sorrow and yearning love of her who lay moaning that corpse above. She smoothed his hair, and she stroked his cheek. 
she half forgot that he could not speak, and fondly whispered endearing words, and murmurs sweet as the song of birds. Willie, oh Willie, my bonny lad, was ever meeting so strange and sad? Four and fifty lone years have passed, since in the flesh I beheld thee last. Thou art comely still, as in the days of yore, and the girl love wells in my heart once more. I thank thee, Lord, that thy tender Ruth suffers mine arms to enfold this youth. For I loved him much, I am now on the brink of the cold, cold grave, and I didn't think. When the lad so long in the pit had lain, these lips would ever press his again. Willie, strange thoughts in my soul arise, while thus I caress thee with loving eyes. We meet, one lifeless, one living yet, as lovers ne'er in this world have met. We are both well nigh of one age, but thou hast coal-black curls and a smooth fair brow. While I, thy chosen, beside thee lie, gray-haired and wrinkled and fain to die. So sobbed the woman, and all the crowd lifted their voices and wept aloud. Wept to behold her, as there she clung, one so aged to one so young. And surely pathos, more deep or keen, in earthly contrast, was never seen. Both had been youthful long years ago, when neither dreamed of the coming woe. But time with the maiden had onward sped, standing still with her lover dead. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To a Hummingbird in a Garden by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org by Joe Brenneman Blithe playmate of the summertime, Admiringly I greet thee. Born in old England's misty clime, I scarcely hoped to meet thee. Comest thou from forests of Peru, Or from Brazil's savannas, Where flowers of every dazzling hue Flaunt, gorgeous as sultanas? Thou scannest me with doubtful gaze, Suspicious little stranger. Fear not thy burnished wings may blaze, Secure from harm or danger. Now here, now there, thy flash is seen, Like some stray sunbeam darting, With scarce a second space between Its coming and departing. Made of the bird that lives sublime, In Pat's immortal blunder, Spied in two places at a time, thou challengest our wonder. Suspended by thy slender bill, sweet blooms thou lovest to rifle. The subtle perfumes they distill might well thy being stifle. Surely the honeydew of flowers is slightly alcoholic, or why through burning August hours dost thou pursue thy frolic? What though thy throatlet never rings? With music soft or stirring, Still like a spinning wheel thy wings Incessantly are whirring. How dearly I would love to see Thy tiny carasposa, As full of sensibility As any coy mimosa. They say when hunters track her nest, Where two warm pearls are lying, She boldly fights, though sore distressed, And sends the brigands flying. What dainty epithets thy tribes have won from men of science. Pedantic and poetic scribes for once are in alliance. Crested coquette and azure crown, sun jewel ruby throated, with flaming topaz crimson down, are names that may be quoted. Such titles aim to paint the hues that on the darlings glitter, and were we for a week to muse, we scarce could light on fitter. Farewell, bright bird, I envy thee, gay rainbow-tinted rover. Would that my life, like thine, were free from care till all is over. End of poem. 
This recording is in the public domain. The Pardoned Sin by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson Up the worn steps and through the ivied porch That screened entrance to the ancient church A gentle schoolboy passed in earnest thought His heart was throbbing and his eyes were filled with tears that trembled Pausing in the nave he looked around with timid glance And gazed on windows lustrous with the blazoned forms of saints and martyrs and angelic hosts and on a priceless miracle of art that o'er the altar hung with mute appeal christ bowed to earth beneath a weighty cross he sighed i also have my cross to bear and to the dim confessional drew nigh a white-haired priest with mild benignant eyes beheld him coming and in gracious tones that oft had wooed the sinner from sin exclaimed uh, my son if thou dost seek mine aid it waits thine asking weep not but lay bare the secret sorrows of thine inmost soul the boy replied my father i have sinned and i am not worthy to be called thy son still if thou wilt my sad confession hear and grant forgiveness in the name of god he knelt with sobs of inarticulate woe he faltered unintelligible words in broken accents so that he who heard failed to interpret their significance in vain he listened patiently at a length loath to confuse the boy dear child he said my ears are dull for i am frail and old i cannot glean the purport of thy speech write i pray thee in the scholar's bag slung from thy shoulder there are doubtless stored a tablet and pencil write i pray the boy obeyed and weeping while he wrote traced the brief record of his self-reproach and meekly gave the tablet to the priest but lo in token that his angel watched the simple child's innumerable tears had blurred and blotted each remorseful line the words were visible to god alone with tears of sympathy the white-haired priest perused the baffling and bewildering signs that told more plainly than the plainest speech the sad sweet anguish of a contrite heart then with a grateful smile he blessed the lord and softly murmured child depart in peace god pardons thee thy penitential tears have washed away all record of thy sin end of poem this recording is in the public domain. The Thistle by George Murray, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Thistle, a legendary ballad. Le cœur de l'histoire est dans la tradition. Twas midnight, darkness, like the gloom of some funereal pall, hung over the battlements of slains a fortress grim and tall the moon and stars were veiled in clouds and from the castle's height no gleam of torch or taper pierced the shadows of the night only the rippling of the dee blent faintly with the sound of weary sentry feet that paced their slow unvarying round the earl was sleeping like a child that hath no cause for fear the warder hummed a careless song his lonely watch to cheer knight squire and page on rush-strewn floors were stretched in sound repose while spears and falchions dim with dust hung round in idle rows and none of all those vessels bold who calmly dreaming lay dreamed that a foe was lurking near impatient for the fray but in that hour when nature self-serenely seemed to sleep in the dim valley of the dee 
a bowshot from the keep a ghost-like multitude defiled in silence from the wood that with its stately pines concealed the fort for many a rood the banner of that spectral host is soiled with murderous stains they are the tigers of the sea the cruel-hearted danes far over the billows they have swept to caledonia's strand they carve the record of their deeds with battle-axe and brand their march each day is tracked with flame their path with carnage strewn for pity is an angel guest their hearts have never known and now the caitiffs steal by night to storm the fort of slains they reck not of the fiery blood that leaps in scottish veins onward they creep with noiseless tread their treacherous feet are bare lest the harsh clang of iron heels their slumbering prey should scare yon moat they vow shall soon be crossed yon rampart soon be scaled and all who hunger for the spoil with spoil shall be regaled press on press on and high in air the raven standard wave those drowsy scots this night shall end their sleep within the grave silent as shadows on they glide the gloomy foss is nigh glory to odin victory's lord its shelving depths are dry speed warriors speed but hark a shriek of agonizing pain bursts from a hundred danish throats again it rings again rank weeds had overgrown the moat now drained by summer's heat and bristling crops of thistles pierce the raiders naked feet that cry like wail of pibroch stirred the sentry's kindling soul and shouting arms to arms he sped the castle bell to toll but ere its echoes died away upon the ear of night each clansman started from his couch and armed him for the fight the drawbridge falls and side by side the bandit heroes fly to grapple with the pirate horde and conquer them or die as eagles on avenging wings from proud ben lomond's crest swoop fiercely down and dash to earth the spoilers of their nest as lions bound upon their prey or as the burning tide sweeps onward with resistless might from some volcano's side so rushed that gallant band of scots the garrison of slains upon the tigers of the sea the carnage loving danes the lurid glare of torches served to light them to their foes they hewed those felons hip and thigh with stern relentless blows claymore and battle-axe and spear were steeped in slaughter's flood while every thistle in the moat was splashed with crimson blood and when the light of morning broke the legions of the danes lay stiff and stark in ghastly heaps around the fort of slains nine hundred years have been engulfed within the grave of time since those grim vikings of the north by death atoned their crime in memory of that awful night the thistle's hardy grace was chosen as the emblem meet of albin's dauntless race and never since in battle's storm on land or on the sea has scotland's honour tarnished been god grant it never may be End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Parable by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org With limbs at rest on the earth's green breast In a dim and solemn wood, A proud form lay on a summer day In listless, dreamy mood. A streamlet slow in the break below when sadly wailing on, with murmurs wild like a restless child that seeketh something gone. The dreamer rose from his vain repose with stern and sullen look, and scornful ire blazed forth like fire, and he cursed the simple brook. Thy murmurs deep disturb my sleep, be still, thou streamlet horse. Small right hast thou a voice, I trow, to tell thy foolish course. The water stirred, or a spirit heard, the spirit of the streams, and a voice replied, and that softly sighed, like a voice we hear in dreams. If the sleeper fear my voice to hear, 
let him stir each rocky stone, whose cruel force impedes my course and makes my waters moan. Oft in my heart strange fancies start, and a voice in plaintive strain sings sadly sings that earthly things were shadowed in my brain. That wealth and birth on God's free earth oft curse the noise and strife, which poor men make as they strive to break through the rugged ways of life. The sad voice sings that ermined kings dream on in stately halls, with curses deep for their broken sleep when an anguished people calls. And when sharp stones wake human moans, they hear but never move, nor lend men strength to win at length the liberty they love. A note on a parable. These verses written at Oxford were given by me to Sir Edwin Arnold and served to fill two pages in his first published volumes entitled Poems, Narrative, and Lyrical. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. An Eastern Judge by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org Before a judge two Arabs came, one to deny and one to claim. And one was young and one was old, they differed like the tales they told. The young man spake, Nine days have flown since the hot sands I crossed alone. My gold, meanwhile, I left in trust, with yon old man reputed just. My journey o'er his tent I sought. He swears I trusted him with naught. Name, said the judge, the sums of gold. And where, I pray thee, was it told? Four score gold pieces did I tell, Beneath a palm tree, by a well. Then spake the judge, Go seek that tree, And hither bid him come to me. But take my seal, that he may know To whom thou biddest him to go. The youth went out into the plain, the old man and the judge remain. An hour passed by, and not a word from either of the twain was heard. At length the judge, he cometh not, dost think the lad hath reached the spot? The old man, startled, answered, no, far over the sands the tree doth grow. The judge spake sternly, like a king, how knowest where that palm doth spring? For in the desert near and far, I trow that many palm trees are. The youth came back and said, The tree returned, answered none to me. He hath been here, the judge to say, The gold is thine, go now thy way. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Lake by Alphonse de Lamartin Translated from the French by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter must we forever to some distant clime drift through the night despairingly away? And can we never on the sea of time cast anchor for a day? O oh, lake, a year hath passed with all its pain, And, by the waves she hoped once more to see, Here, on this stone, I seat myself again, But ask not where is she? Thus didst thou murmur in thy rocky caves, on their torn flanks thy water thus did beat, While the gay zephyr flung thy foaming waves around her fairy feet. One summer eve we floated from thy shores, dost thou recall it? Not a sound was heard, save when the measured cadence of our oars the dreamy silence stirred. Then tones more sweet than earth shall ever hear, Sweet tones that never will be heard again, Woke slumbering echoes round the haunted mere that listened to the strain. O oh, blissful time, suspend thy flight, Dear hours, prolong your stay, And let us taste the fleet delight Of this enchanting day. Alas, too many filled with woe Thy tardiness regret, For these outstrip the winds, But, O, oh, earth's happy ones forget. I ask some moments more in vain, Time's wings more swiftly fly. O oh, rapturous eve, I sigh, remain, lo, Night is in the sky. Come, let us love. The minutes flee. Love may not long abide. Time's river knows no ebb, and we drift onward with the tide. 
O oh, jealous time, say, why must hours like these, that thrill the heart with youthful passion's glow, take wing more quickly on the summer breeze than dismal hours of woe? Can we not fix one joyous moment's trace? Must it from earth be cancelled evermore? Shall time each record of our love efface, refusing to restore? O oh, grand eternity, O oh, solemn past, ye whose abyss engulfs our little day, speak will ye grant again the bliss at last that once ye snatched away o lake beloved mute caves and forest green whose beauty time ne'er suffers to depart keep fresh the memory of that evening scene fair nature in thy heart keep it dear lake in sunshine and in storm in all the varied aspects of thy shore in these dark pines and rocks of savage form that round thy waters soar still let it live in every breeze that sighs in each soft echo that the hills repeat in every star that on thy bosom lies with lustre calm and sweet let night winds murmur to the reeds her name let the faint fragrance that embalms each glade let every sound and sight and scent proclaim here two fond lovers strayed end of poem this recording is in the public domain God's Heroes by George Murray, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. God's Heroes Once, at the battle's close, a soldier met a youthful comrade, whom his eyes had missed amid the dust and tumult of the strife. Flushed with the glow of victory, and proud of wounds received in presence of his chief, he spake in tones of triumph to the boy. I did not see thee in the battle's flame, the stripling answered i was in the smoke then with his hand upon his bleeding heart he closed his eyes and suddenly fell dead so countless heroes oft unheeded fight in life's grim battle hidden by the smoke with patient martyrdom they ply the tasks that god assigns them words of sympathy from human lips too seldom cheer their toil or help them to be victors over pain Few mark their struggles in the crowded world, few soothe their anguish while they inly bleed, and when they answer to the call of death, their names are syllabled on earth no more. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Legend of the Child Jesus, written for a child, by George Murray. Read for LibriVox.org by Pierre Delcourt A Legend of the Child Jesus Written for a Child You ask a story, dearest, here is one, heard oft amid the peasant homes of France. It was the time when Jesus was a child, and, with the Baptist and his cherished lamb, he wandered forth among the hills and dales in the calm hours that closed a summer eve. And they were glad the lambkin frisked and played, or cropped green herbage with its milk-white teeth, while the two cousins gathered wilding flowers, dipped their bare feet in limpid streams, or culled ripe crimson berries from full-laden boughs. As thus they rambled peacefully, it chanced two rustic children met them. These were wroth each with the other, and the stronger held bound by the feet a white and innocent dove, that strove to soar and ever, as she strove, was balked and baffled by a spiteful cord. Out spake the weaker lad, The bird is mine. Why hast thou robbed me? It was I that snared the silly pigeon, and thou hast no right to filch my plaything. Give me back my own. Thereat his comrade stormed a willful, No, thou shalt not have it. I will keep the bird. Then the meek Jesus sorrowfully spack. Lo, with red blood her slender legs are stained. Her eyes are dim, and she is sick to death. How wilt thou find thy pleasure in her pain? I cannot think thou hast a cruel heart, for thou, like me, art still of tender years, too thoughtless may be. Wherefore loose, I pray, this chafing cord, 
and let the captive fly home to her callow nestlings that await her coming and are all agape for food. Then the boy's heart was softened, and he said, Well, hast thou spoken, and thy pitying tones have moved my pity more than I can tell. Thy pleading shames me. I will loose the dove. Would I were like thee, but whate'er I am, thou must not think that I am void of truth. So saying, he unloosed the cord that bound the victim's feet, and, Pretty sufferer, fly, he cried, fly homeward to thy downy nest, in the green woods, and feed thy gaping chicks. But when the other saw the harmless bird freed from her bonds, he stooped and snatched a stone up from the roadside, and with deadly aim and fury hurled it at the joyous dove which dropped to earth as lifeless as the stone, her slim throat mangled by the ragged flint. Then, with keen taunts, he flung her at the feet of Jesus, hissing, Meddler, take thy prize, and grant the darling leave to soar again. But the meek Jesus sadly from the ground raised the dead bird, and said, Alas, poor boy, thou dost not know the evil thou hast wrought by thy brief passion. God himself alone can to a lifeless creature life recall. Then, kneeling down, he humbly joined his hands in prayer, and, looking up to the heaven with eyes that swam in tears, sighed, Oh, that I were God! And once again, ah, would that I were God! Scarce had his prayer upfloated when the dove, kissed by his hallowed lips, unclosed her eyes, opened her light wings, and clove the liquid air. Awestruck, the children watched, then, he whose hand had freed the captive whispered, Art thou God? And Jesus answered him, I cannot tell. Then suddenly a rush of nimble wings whirred, and descending in a golden beam, the dove returned and settled on the brow of the meek Jesus. While it lingered there, the spellbound children heard a solemn voice that fell like music on their ears and cried, I am the God of heaven and he who woke life from death's sleep is my beloved son. Then first the Baptist by these tokens knew that the meek Jesus was the Son of God, and gazing on the twice-born dove, he saw a brown half-circle on her snowy neck, marked newly there in memory of the wound healed by the kisses of the Holy Child. End of poem this recording is in the public domain. The Time Will Come, Rondeau, by George Murray, read for LibriVox.org, by Thomas Peter. The time will come when thou and I shall meet once more before we die. The links of passion's broken chain shall be united once again in coming days for which we sigh. And thus the sorrows I defy that cloud the sunshine of our sky, for hope still sings her sweet refrain, the time will come. Oh, that the hours which loiter by would match my swift desire and fly, but fond impatience I restrain, sure that love's trust is not in vain, and that in answer to my cry, the time will come. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Lesson of Mercy by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org by Joe Brenneman Beneath a palm tree, by a clear, cool spring, God's prophet Muhammad lay slumbering, Till roused by chance he saw before him stand A foeman, durther, scimitar in hand. The chieftain bade the startled sleeper rise, And with a flame of triumph in his eyes, who can save thee, Muhammad, he cried. God, said the prophet, God, my friend and guide. All struck the Arab dropped his naked sword, which grasped by Muhammad defied its lord. And who can save thee now, thy blade is won, exclaimed the prophet. Durther answered, none. Then spake the victor, though thy hands are red, with guiltless blood unmercifully shed, I spare thy life 
I give thee back thy steel, henceforth compassion for the helpless feel. And thus the twain, unyielding foes of yore, clasp hands in token that their feud was o'er. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The King and the Peasant by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org Quote Verily I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. New Testament Once, at the self-same point of time, two mortals passed from earth. One was a king of caste sublime, but base the other's birth, and each had led a stainless life amid the sinful planet's strife. Upward the spirits took their flight, enfranchised and elate, till soon they reached the realms of light and paused at Eden's gate, where waiting them with joy they see the fishermen of Galilee. He oped the gate, one lustrous stone, and ushered in the king, while the poor peasant left alone heard songs of welcoming, and strains of harps, divinely sweet, poured forth the royal guest to greet. The music ceased, the heavenly guide flung back the gate again, and bade the peasant at his side join the seraphic train. But strange to say, no angels sang, no harps through heaven's symphonious rang. O saint revered, the peasant cried, why chant no choirs for me? As for yon monarch in his pride, Am I less dear than he? Can aught but equity have birth here in high heaven as on the earth? My son, the saint replied, thou art as dear as kingly clay, but men like thee of lowly heart come hither every day, while dives at the gate appear only once in a hundred years. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Story of Brother Paul by George Murray, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Story of Brother Paul, as told to a friend in the convent garden. Suggested by a picture by Frank Dixie, A.R.A. Dear friend, you question me if I am happy, and I thus reply. How can I be so when my life seems an interminable strife between a pure but earthly love and voices calling from above? You start, my words sound strange and wild, the language of some wayward child, and so you marvel, I forget, the six long years since last we met. You knew me then as Paul d'Estre, you find me Brother Paul today. A pale worn monk whose life of woes is nearing to a welcome close. Nay, speak not yet, for though I hate my tragic story to relate, here in this convent garden where the sunlight streams the flowers are fair and all around seems breathing balm as though each restless heart to calm still i will bear my inmost soul to you who pity and condole no lapse of time can ever destroy the hallowed memory of the joy i felt when first i gazed upon the face of gabrielle yvonne your subtlest words can scarce express the magic of her loveliness her guileless eyes and golden hair still haunt my vision everywhere. And in the convent, when I paint scenes from the life of some sweet saint, some priceless manuscript to grace, each picture but repeats her face. Our souls were one. We had no thought but for each other. Life was not while we were parted, and I swore fond vows, still cherished as of yore. Our homes, before my father died, lay closely nestling side by side. My castle now with all its lands has passed forever from my hands. And had my pride not met this fall, I would not here be Brother Paul. My father died. His life had been a course of recklessness and sin since his young wife had passed away. And for the first time on the day when with vain pomp his limbs were laid within the ancestral chapel's shade, I learned that if our ancient name could be redeemed from scorn and shame, I must at once prepare to roam a ruined exile from my home. But worse than all, my Gabriel's sire cursed my wrecked fortunes in his ire, and sternly bade me never again set foot within his broad domain. 
enough i left my natal place but saved our honor from disgrace years passed wherever my footsteps sped my pencil won me fame and bread and in my paintings you can trace always the same angelic face for earthly maid almost too fair with guileless eyes and golden hair far from this cloister years ago a youth whom erst i used to know here in loved normandy revealed news he might better have concealed thy fair-haired gabrielle is wed they lied and told her thou wast dead i fell beneath this lightning stroke and from my trance when i awoke six months with raving frenzy rife were cancelled from my weary life twas then that cankered by despair dazed by the world's remorseless glare i passed within this convent wall to bear the name of brother paul and am i happy now you ask behold me do i wear a mask i scourge my flesh i fast i pray but in each moment of each day between myself and heaven i trace the shadow of a saintly face for earthly maid almost too fair with guileless eyes and golden hair one eve my sorrows to allay i sought in solitude to pray and while i meekly stood before the sombre abbey's open door i heard some footsteps lightly fall on the paved walk that skirts the wall and as i turned my glances fell upon the face of gabrielle our eyes but for a moment met in one sad gaze of fond regret then in dead silence passing on the woman that i loved was gone close by her side she led a child whose lips angelically smiled while his small hand was reaching nigh two butterflies that floated by ha ah, who can guess the yearning pain with which i saw my love again or who can blame me for the sin of musing on what might have been with a strange thrill of tender joy i gazed upon the lovely boy till both his mother's self and he seemed to belong by right to me and fancy tempted me to deem the past a false and evil dream but reason woke I passed within the abbey's gloom and strove to win Christ's pardon for the thoughts that still confused my soul against my will. And now my hapless tale is told. One vision haunts me as of old. One image never will depart till death shall hush this throbbing heart. And trusting to the love of God, I sleep at last beneath the sod. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Robert Burns by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Large-hearted minstrel, from the sphere where now thou dwellest, If thine eyes can watch the spellbound myriads, Here, whose lips thy genius eulogize, If pain thou feelest now no more, Thy wayward life's wild battle o'er, If tears that at thy memory start Can touch thy sympathetic heart, On this thy birthday we would fain hope, even if the hope be vain, that thou with tranquil joy mayst see the loving honours paid to thee, thou laureate of the poor, whose song o'er the charmed earth shall echo long. As stars that garish day concealed shine forth amid the shades of night, so thy dark destiny revealed each fault and frailty to our sight. The nightingale that sings forlorn with bosom pressed against a thorn is type of thee, whose noblest lays were hymned in sorrow clouded days. Bard of the vale and stream and grove, thou lyric oracle of love. Genius by signs that cannot lie flash in full glory from thine eye. In thee a hero's ardor burned, in thee a woman's pity yearned passion and pathos fire and tears baptized thy life's few tragic years so in the summer cloud that lowers keen lightning lurks with gentle showers so from their depths volcanoes spring the fire flood in the healing spring gaze on the poet's stalwart form dilating through the mist and storm the whirlwind shrieks the thunders roll they wake fierce echoes in his soul hark mid the elemental war he hears the battle's maddening roar the tempest loud and louder raves he treads on scottish heroes graves they wake they rise past the scenes return it is the fight of bannockburn 
he sees he thrills he glows as battling for the ground they trod his phantom brethren red what shod charge over trampled course and clod down on their southern foes his ardent spirit onward sped to join the exulting throng his banner was the lightning red his march the whirlwind overhead and scots what hay we wallace bled his glorious battle song and yet dumb cattle and the silly sheep smoored in a snowdrift made this hero weep crushed by his plough the daisy upward turns its dying eye and wins immortal tears the nest robbed mousy numb with piteous fears the wee bird chittering on a frozen spray hungry and cold on winter's bleakest day to all of these the strong man's pity yearns what helpless thing but melts the heart of burns he sang his comrades unrenowned shepherds and tillers of the ground brave poverty inglorious worth the guiltless conquerors of earth heroic souls of humblest life stern soldiers in the ceaseless strife waged since his planet's course began twixt hard necessity and man their lowly joys their labours dull the poet's touch made beautiful he deemed not common or unclean his spirit sanctified the mean and the rude mattock in his hand seemed like a sceptre of command so he is loved throughout the earth beyond the land that gave him birth so where his youth and manhood toiled undaunted still though sorely foiled where once he broke the stubborn clod he reigned supreme a household god and pilgrims venerate the spot where stands the poet's clay-built cot in cities where mid smoke and gloom the engine clanks and whirs the loom where mid a wilderness of bricks grim toil and trade their empire fix and want and affluence side by side our world on traffic's roaring tide where dim discoloured streams that erst from mossy springs clear bubbling burst now clogged and silent welter on with all their light and music gone there by the foundry's furnace glow or black canal barge laden slow among the toiling swarms of men the minstrel of the lynn and glen hath lays to captivate each year for joy a laugh for grief a tear and burns to them is dearer far than shakespeare's self and milton are dearer because there runs some vein warm from his heart through every strain what though he be no cultured sage rich in the lore of classic page he tells them that the honest poor in god's eyes never are obscure that rank and riches blood and birth are but the accidents of earth and that a garb of hot and grey is not less grand than king's array if he who wears it will and can uphold the dignity of man and thus the shepherd on the moor the lasses bleaching on the braes the good wife spinning at the door the reaper in the noontide blaze the wayworn hunter on the fell the milkmaid in the hazel dell the fisher rocked upon the deep the mother ere her bare sleep australian herdsmen as they roam and settlers in a new world home sailors amid the atlantic main and soldiers on the indian plain joyful or joyless all in turns sing the sweet songs of robert burns those miracles of matchless art that nestle warmly in each heart end of poem this recording is in the public domain the swiss deserter by george murray read for LibriVox.org by thomas peter in Strasbourg's fortress, old and strong, began this sore mischance of mine. I heard an alpine horn prolong its echoes from across the Rhine. I heard, I plunged, and strove to gain my native shore, alas, in vain. T'was at the darkest hour of night, when I, the homesick boy, was caught, and with my arms both pinioned tight before the unpitying captain brought. My mates had dragged me from the wave, and not, O oh God, my life can save. Tomorrow, at the hour of ten, before the regiment I must stand, and humbly ask their pardon then, obedient to the chief's command, doomed for my crime without delay, 
the penalty of death to pay comrades ye see me be it known for the last time on earth to-day twas the young herdsman who alone caused that my life must pass away his alpine horn bewitched my youth to yearn for home god knows the truth ye three that armed with rifles stand loved comrades hear my last desire see that ye lift no trembling hand aim true together when ye fire straight let each bullet pierce my heart i ask this only ere we part o lord who art the king of heaven draw my poor soul to thee on high may all my frailties be forgiven by thy great mercy ere i die hereafter let me dwell with thee o lord my god remember me end of poem this recording is in the public domain A Dream About the Aspen by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson Oh, know ye why the aspen leaves so tremulously sigh When through the burning summer noon no breeze is heard on high? When the green canopies that crown the woodlands are at rest And gladden faint wayfaring men with shadows calm and blessed? In the dread hour when God's own Son upon the cross was nailed the fierce red splendor of the sun in midnight gloom was veiled earth's bosom heaved and girt around with darkness deep and still men bowed like frail wind-shaken reeds before god's mighty will with dim presentiment of woe each beast concealed his form and shrank within his craven home as though beneath a storm no bird wing fluttered in the grove or floated through the air and nature's heart had ceased to beat, wrung deeply by despair, save that the shrouded trees and flowers still murmured low in thought, and wailing told of deeds of blood and justice set at naught, of bigot priests and traitor hearts and faith for a silver bought. The cedar groves on Lebanon a dirge like music made, and dark as night athwart the hills was flung their giant shade, while softly from a weeping tree, the tree of Babylon, a voice in lonely whisper sighed, "'Tis finished! He is gone!' Then, deeply down, she hung her boughs within Euphrates' stream, and ever dreameth of his death a life-enduring dream." Calmly beneath the eye of heaven the glowing vineyards slept. The vintner watched the big bright tears that from the branches wept. And when the purple clusters dropped and the new wine was pressed, mindful he named it Tears of Christ, and still that name is blessed. But soon a vapor round the mount arose with fragrant flow, breathed from the very soul of love, compassionating woe by the night-blooming violet to cool the burning brain of him whose thorn-encircled brow throbbed wildly in its pain mournfully spake the cypress then my branches i will wave in memory of this awful hour for ever by the grave and through the sultry dimness passed a gently wafted breath as to the cross an angel mood stern messenger of death a sad voice groaned my god my god why hast thou me forsaken and all the trees and flowers with fear and agony were shaken the aspen shook not she alone a proud unpitying tree stood tearless motionless beside the mount of calvary and thus outspake the haughty one what reck we of thy pain why should we weep we trees and flowers are free from sinful stain soon will my sisters cease to pine this hour will soon be o'er a bright epiphany of joy shall beam for evermore then death's dark angel took the cup red with the saviour's blood and at the cold proud aspen's root poured forth the mystic flood and spake strange words and by those words the miserable tree was cursed 
and every leaf was doomed a quivering leaf to be until that old old curse be dead her branches cannot rest but still she feareth trembleth still when all is calm and blessed scorn not the tale those thoughts were born within a childlike heart e'en as the tears that in our eyes so oft unbidden start born like the strains that gush from out the forest warbler's breast that soft or shrill are bird songs still and may not be repressed then scoff not at the simple tale nor deem the legend wild it was not woven that the ears of men might be beguiled but that men's eyes might trace the form of truth in fiction's stream and read a world-old god-framed law foreshadowed in a dream slowly tis learnt by heart although by memory quickly caught faintly tis writ in tears upon the tablets of the thought still still that law of exile lives the ban of heaven above that they who shut love out shall be in turn shut out from love end of poem this recording is in the public domain brotherly love or the sight of king solomon's temple by george murray read for librivox dot org by larry wilson there is a sweet traditionary tale dear to each brother of the mystic tie which though recording but a simple deed a simple deed and yet how full of love i would that men might hear and take to heart the tale's clear echo like some lute that thrills mid lordlier instruments hath floated down borne like a perfume on the breath of time from the dim age of solomon the king and even now its music is not dead nor can it die so long as human hearts feel the quick pulse of brotherhood leap high the harvest moon was shining on the grain that waved all golden in the fields around the stately city of jerusalem there a few acres all the wealth they owned two brothers dwelt together most unlike in outward form and aspect but the same in deep unfailing tenderness of soul stalwart and strong one brother drove the plough or plied the sickle with untiring arm the while his fragile comrade seemed to droop beneath the heat and burden of the day as one not fitted for the toils of life well knowing this the elder brother rose at dead of night and woke his sleeping wife and said dear heart my brother is not strong ill hath he borne the burden of the day reaped the full grain and bound the yellow sheaves i will arise and while my brother sleeps will of my shocks take here and there a sheaf at random that he may not note the loss and add the grain thus pilfered to his store and god well knoweth that we shall not miss the sheaves devoted to a brother's need so the man rose up in the dead of night and as his great heart prompted so he did now while the younger brother pondered on his bed unwitting of his brother's gracious deed kind thoughts like angels visited his soul and thus he spake communing with himself scant is my harvest but i am alone and thus it haps my harvest is not scant nor have i need to lay up store on earth for death treads closely on the heels of life seeing that these things are so let me do what good i may before i travel hence and be no more my brother has a wife and babes to work for and he is not rich from sunrise unto sunset though he toils i will arise and while my brother sleeps will of my shocks take here and there a sheaf and add the grain thus pilfered to his store for tis not fitting that my share should be equal to his who hath more need than i so he too rose up in the dead of night and as his great heart prompted so he did but all the time he wrought that loving deed he trod the field with feather-footed care and paused at times and listened while the sheaves shook in his arms and every grain that dropped left his face pallid as the moon's white ray so like a man with guilt upon his soul full of vain fears 
he wrought his task and then stole like a shadow to his lonely bed and slept the night that cometh to the good and thus these two moved by the self-same love each on the other nightly did bestow the kindly boon much wondering that his shocks did show no less though robbed of many sheaves at length one night while tenderly the moon looked down from heaven on their unselfish love the brothers met the arms of both were filled with golden sheaves and then they understood the riddle that they could not read before the simple tale for to the neighbors round each brother fondly told his brother's deed soon through the garrulous streets was noised abroad until twas whispered at the royal court and reached the ears of solomon the king its pathos stole like music to his heart and stirred the fountain of delicious tears and thus he spake the ground whereupon that deed was wrought henceforth is consecrated earth for surely it is sanctified by love the love that loveth to do good by stealth i therefore leagued with hiram king of tyre who hews me cedar trees on lebanon and aided also by the widow's son cunning to work in silver and in gold will on that field erect the house of god exceedingly magnifical and high because i ween that nowhere in the world a sight more holy shall i ever find so it was done according to his word and god's own house was builded on the spot where those two brothers in the moonlight met each with the golden sheaves within his arms End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Days That Are No More by George Murray. Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. O oh, call back yesterday, bid time return. Shakespeare. Poor faded flower, thy pale dead form hath caused the tears to start and stirred the waters of my lonely heart with strange angelic power long years ago ere life's glad sunshine languished into shade thou wast the fragrant offering of a maid fair as the world can show let me call up the past's dim ghosts by memory's potent spell one pearl at least is left for which tis well to drain grief's bitter cup twas summer eve and she and i fair maiden and fond boy together wandered full of such deep joy as age can ne'er retrieve the cherished scene gleams through a mist of tears and memory sees the velvet turf the patriarchal trees the woodland cool and green a silver lake before us slumbered herds of timid deer with horns thrown back came trooping to the mere from many a leafy rake with large bright eyes and ears erect they marked our coming feet one moment paused then vanished in retreat swift as a falcon flies a fairy boat rocked on the ripples captive to a bow i loosed its chain and o'er the shallop's prow through lily leaves afloat eve's golden rays streamed o'er our path my sweet companion steered straight for a greenly wooded isle that peered dimly through crimson haze we did not speak when bliss is infinite what need of speech our keel soon grated on the pebbly beach that fringed a sheltered creek so strayed we on through shadowy aisles of close embracing trees whose restless foliage murmured like the seas a slumberous monotone green twinkling leaves lit by slant sunbeams tremulously made quaint shifting arabesques of light and shade such as not earthly weaves the zephyrs sigh and hum of insect swarms alone were heard save when some squirrel leapt or nestling bird sang vespers from on high with silent joy we stood and gazed and listened there was not to mar the spell by one intrusive thought that might our dreams annoy each sense seemed drowned in waves of happiness i turned to tell my soul's deep bliss to her who knew it well her looks perused the ground there flowering wild mid emerald leaves and buds with ruby tips 
crimson and dewy as her own sweet lips a fragrant blossom smiled with loving heed i stooped to pluck it from its verdant nook when she with playfully capricious looks stooped and forestalled the deed then arch coquette she flashed upon me her bewildering eyes in saucy triumph and displayed the prize and then our fingers met her soft white hand sent a keen shiver through my tingling frame each vein seemed glowing with a subtle flame that each pulsation fanned i took the flower i caught her hand and clasped it in my own and murmured vows in fond impassioned tone accordant with the hour she did not check the heaving tides of passion's fiery flood but the quick current of her tell-tale blood rushed over face and neck the faint pink flush of dainty seashell or deep-bosomed rose rich sunset hues asleep on virgin snows scarce typify her blush and then she sighed the small white teeth within her lips apart gleamed like the raindrops that some bud's red heart caressing half doth hide she did not move her eyes half closed in languor's dim eclipse i pressed upon the blossom of her lips the first sweet kiss of love ah me ah me the fondest joys endure but for a day while pains make nest homes in our hearts and stay and so twill ever be the maid is gone she whose rare nature formed my soul's delight long since to kindred angels took her flight and i am left alone but there is balm still for my woe the memory of her smiles back to youth's morning land my heart beguiles and brings elysian calm and thus i vow though color beauty fragrance all are fled from the pale flower that lies before me dead i hold it sacred now and i would fling the queenliest blooms aside that sent the breeze in odorous isles of blue pacific seas for this poor withered thing end of poem this recording is in the public domain the deaf girl by george murray read for LibriVox.org by joe brenneman when childhood's laughing tones reveal deep blessedness of heart i faint the joy i long to feel and check the sobs that start shrouding the agony that lies within my dim tear-blinded eyes because on earth eternally the door of sound is closed for me and man man knoweth not the key in solitude i love to dream of what i may not hear and muse how sweet a sound must seem a human voice how dear alas that dreams which soothe and bless should be so full of nothingness i wake in all is mystery the door of sound is closed for me and man man knoweth not the key i shall not long be here on earth my mother's eyes are wet she felt even when she gave me birth my star would quickly set i grow less earthly day by day then tell me why should death delay god calls me home god sets me free the door of sound is closed for me but oh it shall not always be my form is frail my sight is dim life's tide is ebbing fast my failing senses seem to swim and all will soon be past peace peace i hear sweet angel tones singing in heaven round the thrones one last brief prayer on bended knee the door of sound is oped for me but god god only held the key end of poem this recording is in the public domain the neapolitans to mozart by george murray Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Strange musical wizard, the spells of thine art Can ne'er but with life from our memory depart. The notes are now hushed, 
but their echo still rolls like a slow ebbing tide o'er our passionate souls fair naples thou knowest is the home of sweet song and thither earth's minstrels all lovingly throng inspired are the pilgrims who visit this shrine but when have we known inspiration like thine the kings of this world never heard on their thrones such rare modulations such jubilant tones the music of dreams is less marvellous far than the chords of thy ravishing harmonies are with thy nostrils dilated and tremulous lips thine eyes lit with glory that naught can eclipse thou seemest some angel and multitudes trace god's breath passing shadow-like over thy face where learnt thy weird fingers each exquisite strain that floods our quick spirits with pleasure or pain who taught thee to wake from mute ivory keys low moans like deep thunder sighs soft as the breeze our poets have chronicled oft in their rhyme fantastic old legends of madness and crime of human souls bartered for gold might or fame in compact with one whom we shudder to name is it thus thou hast gained supernatural skill hast thou mortgaged thy soul to the spirit of ill away with thy harmony wizard but no those tones are seraphic it cannot be so there are beings we know of celestial birth commissioned to haunt this dim planet of earth their silver-winged legions float ever in air our eyes may not see them but still they are there perchance some bright minister now at thy side to music's keen pathos thy fingers may guide for oh thy rapt strains and their tenderness seem like snatches of angel song heard in a dream see see on thy finger there flashes a gem its radiance is fit for a king's diadem cast off that ring wizard some musical sprite dwells shrined in that jewel's ineffable light now strike the still chords sweeter murmurs are heard like the whispers of love or the song of a bird our tears fall like rain stranger give us thy prayers men have entertained angels ere now unawares End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The New Year's Night of an Unhappy Man From the Prose of Jean-Paul Richter Translated by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson Once on a time it was the New Year's Night. An old man at his window stood and gazed upon the myriad-eyed and changeless heaven, and on the pure white earth whereon there sighed no human soul so hopeless as his own in mute despair he gazed upon his grave the snows of age and not the green of youth shrouded its blackness and that woeful man out of his whole rich life now thither brought not but a load of follies sins and cares a wasted frame a desolated heart and lone old age embittered with remorse and now like ghosts the bright days of his youth hovered about him and he stood once more at life's dread crossroad by his father's side its right-hand pathway led by sunny tracks of virtue to a paradise of peace full of glad harvests and of glorious light but the left strayed through labyrinths of vice down to a dismal poison dropping cave where serpents darted mid the dark damp night ah uh, now those serpents writhed about his breast those poisoned droppings paralyzed his tongue he learnt the error of his choice too late crushed by despair he sobbed aloud to heaven give back my youth o oh god and oh my sire place me once more upon that branching road that once again my pathway i may choose in vain his father and his youth were gone he saw strange lights that danced above the marsh and died within the graveyard and he sighed those were my sinful days he watched a star shoot from the skies and glimmer to its fall to be extinguished on the gloomy earth that star is i 
he groaned, and fell remorse gnawed at his wounds again with serpent fangs. Suddenly, music for the newborn year, like distant church song, floated from a tower. His soul was stirred. He gazed around the earth and mused upon the playmates of his youth, who happier now and holier far than he were teachers of the world, world-honored men, fathers of loving children. And he cried, I, to my sire, might now have happy been, the new year's bidding had I erst fulfilled. He bowed his head, hot penitential tears streamed on the snow. Again he softly sighed, hopeless, unconscious almost. Come again, O oh, my lost youth, come back it came again for on that strange and solemn new year's night he had but dreamed his youth was left him still his errors only had not been a dream with grateful soul he poured his thanks to god that he was spared still young to turn aside from sin's foul ways and follow the fair track that leads the pilgrim to a land of peace turn then aside with him thou wayward youth who standest doubting on the road of life this ghastly dream was pictured for thy sake if e'er grown old in anguish thou shouldst cry come back once more o vanished youth come back the golden years can never more return end of poem this recording is in the public domain the sower by victor hugo Translated from the French by George Murray. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Sower Peaceful and cool, the twilight grey Draws a dim curtain over the day, While in my cottage porch I lurk And watch the last lone hour of work. The fields around are bathed in dew, And with emotion filled I view An old man clothed in rags Who throws the seed amid the channeled rose. His shadowy form is looming now, high over the furrows of the plough. Each motion of his arm betrays a boundless faith in future days. He stalks along the ample plain, comes, goes, and flings abroad the grain. Unnoted through the dreamy haze, with meditative soul I gaze. At last the vapours of the night dilate to heaven the old man's height, till every gesture of his hand seems to my eyes sublimely grand end of poem this recording is in the public domain the lamp of hero by louise ackerman translated from french by george murray when hero's lover reckless of the storm each night more hungry for his stealthy bliss swam the swift channel to the trembling form that waited with a kiss. A lamp with rays that welcomed from afar streamed through the darkness, vigilant and bright, as though in heaven's large immortal star unveiled its throbbing light. The scourging billows strove to blind his eyes, the winds let loose their fury on the air, and the scared seagulls shrieked discordant cries, foreboding death's despair. But from the summit of the lonely tower the lamp still streamed above the waters dim, and the bold swimmer felt redoubled power nerve each exhausted limb. As the dark billows and the winds at strife whelmed in their wrath the lovesick boy of old, so round humanity the storms of life, since time was born, have rolled. But while each lightning flash reveals a tomb, which yawns insatiate for each wretch that cowers, in the same dangers and the same dense gloom, the same true lamp is ours. Through the dull haze it glimmers, dim and pale, the winds and waters struggle but in vain, in clouds of foam their guiding star to veil, for still it gleams again. And we, with faces lifted to the sky, filled with fresh hopes, the raging billows cleave, faint but encouraged by the light on high, our venture to achieve. Pharos of love, that in the blackest night dost guide our course amid the rocks and shoals. O lamp of hero, fail not with thy light to cheer our sinking souls. 
End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Funeral of a Village Girl by Julien Auguste Briseux Translated from the French by George Murray The Funeral of a Village Girl From the French of Julien Auguste Briseux When fair Louise, half child, half woman, died Like some frail blossom crushed by wind and rain Her bier was followed by no morning train One priest alone accompanied Who sighed, brief prayers to which in accents soft and low a boy attendant answered, full of woe. Louise was poor. In death, our common lot, the rich have honours which the poor have not. A simple cross of wood, a faded pall, these were her funeral honours, this was all. And when the sexton from the cottage room conveyed her light young body to the tomb, a bell tolled faintly, as if loath to say, so sweet a maiden had been called away. Twas thus she died. And thus, by hill and dale, mid broom whose fragrance floated on the gale, and past green cornfields at the dawn of day, the scant procession humbly took its way. April had lately burst upon the earth, in all the glory that attends her birth, and tenderly upon the passing bier she snowed her blossoms and she dropped her tear. Flowers pink and white arrayed the hawthorn now, while starry buds were trembling on each bough. Sweet scents and harmonies the air caressed, and every bird was warbling in its nest. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Keeper's Son by André Thurier. Translated from the French by George Murray. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Keeper's Son. Black is the night. And as though in fight, their arms the trees of the forest wave, and not a sound can be heard around, but rain that rushes, and winds that rave. The doors are shut in yon woodland hut, an aged sire and his fearless sons, three poachers keen, with a bloodhound lean, crouch in the thicket and load their guns. Within the gloom of that hut's low room, an infant sleeps by the grandam's bed, while a maiden fair near the slumbering pair sits at the spindle with drooping head. A flickering lamp through the midnight damp illumes her cheek with a feeble light, aiding to trace a sweet flower-like face and curls that stray over a neck snow-white. Fair is her form, but her bosom warm fitfully heaves like the ocean's breast. Is it fright or care or the stifling air or waiting? that causes her wild unrest the hinge is weak of the frail door creak and a rainy squall from the outer gloom driveth a boy the fair maiden's joy into the shadowy silent room clasped in her arms he rebukes alarms and cries sweet alice what need of fright she pleadeth oh speak soft and low my grandam's slumber is ever light their hearts beat high with ecstasy and the maiden wipes, while she softly speaks, the raindrops cold that like tears have rolled down her boy-lover's white brow and cheeks. My love is wild for thee, sweet child, he cried. She murmurs, eve, morn, and noon, for thee I sigh, but my darling, why wast thou the son of the keeper born? For higher far than our forests are, a barrier rises to part us twain and I dread his ire should my jealous sire learn that I love and am loved again. He soothed her fears, and he kissed the tears that overflowed from her soft brown eyes. But while deep joy thrilleth maid and boy, day swiftly follows the night that flies. Far off they hear shrill chanticleer, Bird, if I owned thee, thou soon hadst died, the lover speaks while the morning breaks, and the maiden opens the casement wide. The storm is over, and the blithe larks soar aloft like specks in the clear blue sky. One more sweet kiss, full of passion's bliss, now till eve cometh again. Goodbye. Swift as a deer with no sense of fear, the youthful lover then lightly broke through the moorland's maze, over which thick haze swam like a quivering wreath of smoke. 
but the poachers bold wet famished cold with empty game bags behind their backs were homeward beating a slow retreat fur and feather alike each legs a light branch stirred and their quick ears heard shoot the same instant exclaimed the sire three shots ring out and three voices shout the game has fallen before our fire deep bayed the hound with a doleful sound the sire pressed onward then shrank aghast mid the brushwood died with a crimson tide the son of the keeper had breathed his last end of poem this recording is in the public domain Iphigenia at Orlis by George Murray read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Iphigenia at Orlis Euripides Had I the voice of Orpheus, O oh my sire, and could I charm the stones to follow me, beguiling hearers sweetly to my will, words I would use, but now my only spell lies in my tears, for tears are all I have i hold no suppliant bow but touch thy knees with this frail body which she bore for thee i pray thee slay me not before my time for sweet it is to look upon the light but thou wouldst thrust me down to nether gloom i was the first to call thee father thou didst call me first thy child and i did cling first to thy knees and shower upon thy lips sweet loving kisses which thy lips returned and thou wouldst say my darling shall i live to see thee blooming in some chieftain's halls a joyous bride an honour to thy sire and i would answer toying with thy beard which now my hand doth fondly still caress my father shall it be when thou art old that i shall cherish thee within my home repaying thus the nurture of my youth i do remember me of all these words but thou forgetting them dost seek my death spare me i pray by pelops by thy sire and by my mother too who at my birth felt pangs less keen than those my death will cause what part or lot have i in helen's loves or why should paris ruin also me look on me father grant one look one kiss that if i fail to move thee by my words i may in death at least remember these my brother weak i fear me is thine aid still weep with me with me beseech our sire to spare thy sister there may be a sense of sorrow even in an infant's mind behold how silently he prays to thee my father pity me and spare my life two beings dear to thee are at thy feet he still a nursling i a maiden grown one last brief plea i urge tis very sweet to live and look upon the light but death is darkness they are mad who pray to die life is more precious than the noblest death end of poem this recording is in the public domain After the Battle by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia After the Battle Once on a time, it matters little when, on English ground, it matters little where, a fight was fought upon a summer day when skies were blue and waving grass was green. The wild flower, fashioned by the almighty hand to be a perfumed goblet for the dew, felt its enameled cup filled high with blood and shrinking from the horror drooped and died many an insect that derives its hue from harmless leaves and tender bladed herbs was stained anew that day by dying man and marked its wanderings with unnatural track the painted butterfly that soared from earth bore blood upon the edges of its wings the stream ran red the trampled soil became a quagmire whence from sullen pools that formed in prints of human feet and horses hoofs the one prevailing hue of stagnant blood still lowered and glimmered at the cloudless sun 
the lonely moon upon the battleground shone brightly oft while stars kept mournful watch and winds from every quarter of the earth blew over it ere the traces of the fight were worn away they lurked and lingered long in trivial signs surviving nature far above the evil passions of mankind her old serenity recovered soon and smiled upon the guilty battleground as she had done when it was innocent the lark sang high above it swallows skimmed and dipped and flitted gaily to and fro the shadows of the flying clouds pursued each other swiftly over grass and corn and field and woodland over roof and spire of peaceful towns embosomed among trees into the glowing distance far away upon the borders of the earth and sky where the red sunsets faded crops were sown and reaped and harvested the restless stream that once was red with carnage turned a mill men whistled at the plough or tossed the hay and bands of gleaners gathered up the grain in sunny pastures sheep and oxen browsed boys whooped and called to scare the pilfering birds smoke rose from cottage chimneys sabbath bells rang with sweet chimes old people lived and died the timid creatures of the field and grove the simple blossoms of the garden plot grew up and perished in their destined terms and all amid the blood-steeped battleground where thousands upon thousands had been slain but there were deep green patches in the corn that peasants gazed upon at first with awe year after year those patches reappeared and children knew that men and horses lay in mouldering heaps beneath each fertile spot the village hind who ploughed that teeming soil shrank from the large worms that abounded there the bounteous sheaves it never failed to yield were called the battle sheaves and set apart and no one knew a battle sheaf to be born in the last load at a harvest home for many a year each furrow that was turned revealed some crumbling record of the fight and by the roadside there were wounded trees and scraps of hacked and broken fence and wall where deadly struggles erst had taken place and trampled spots where not a blade would grow for many a year no smiling village girl would dress her bosom or adorn her hair with fragrant blossoms from that field of death and when the seasons oft had come and gone the crimson berries growing there were thought to leave too deep a stain upon the hands of those that plucked them end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Madonna's Isle by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org Embosomed on the deep there lay A green Elysian isle With curving shore and crystal bay Whose waters glowed a while Crimson and golden as the day Set down a parting smile It seemed to sleep a holy spot Amid the sleepless sea Where guilt and grief might be forgot And man from passion free might cease the sole black sullying blot on God's fair earth to be. There, like some phantom that we meet in visions of the night, the tenant of that calm retreat, arrayed in stainless white, strayed, lost in meditation sweet, a virgin pure and bright. Bright as the dreams of childhood sleep, which waft the soul to heaven, pure as the tears that angels weep when man with God hath striven and sinned a dread sins perchance too deep, too dark to be forgiven. She knelt immaculately fair, with love illumined face, and like some lute the voice of prayer, three spells around the place, up floating through the summer air to reach the throne of grace. But hark, hoarse sounds her prayer arrest, her piteous face is pale, for lo, to that green Eden nest, a boat with sunlit sail airily skims o'er ocean's breast like seabird in the gale its crew are rovers bold and free men stained with human gore and when they marked with savage glee the presence on the shore they bounded madly o'er the sea with lengthened sweep of oar rude threats they mutter as they row against the hallowed one 
They scoff and jeer, they do not know, the mother of God's son. Heaven shield their helpless prey, for oh, compassion they have none. With eyes upraised that maiden mild, in speechless woe implored, quick succour from a sinless child, he, offspring, but her lord. It came in shrieks of terror wild, burst from the pirate horde. Fiercely Euroclidon awoke, and lashed each angry wave. Far echoing peals of thunder spoke in tones that shook the brave, while shadowy depths asunder broke in many a yawning grave. Men struggled with unearthly might, and gasped with gurgling breath, and when the lightning in its flight glared on the wreck beneath, just God, it was a ghastly sight to see their ghastly death. The gentle moon hath charms to still the murmurs of the main, as mothers at their own sweet will can soothe an infant's pain. That night she hushed them not until that ruthless band was slain. And when Billow's vengeful might had swept those sinners o'er, oh, calmly then her cloudless light the gentle moon did pour upon the virgin clothed in white still kneeling on the shore. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Wild Flower by Gustave Lemoine Translated from the French by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia A Wild Flower A gleaner brown, a rustic flower, Loved the rich peasant's only son, but she could bring no other dower than the fond heart that he had won. She wept. The father said at last, Go, reap yon barley field of mine, if when three days from now have passed, the task is done, my boy is thine. Come listen to my mournful strain, a simple story, sweet and sad, this tale of one who loved in vain, was told me by a harvest lad. The father spoke, the listening maid, with joy and love nigh swooned away. Forthwith she seized the reaper's blade, and deftly plied it night and day. When faint and wearied in despair, she felt her yearning strength depart, she drew fresh courage from her prayer, and prayer was prompted by her heart. Come listen to my mournful strain, a simple story, sweet and sad, this tale of one who loved in vain, was told me by a harvest lad. A daisy in her path delays the tender glances of her eye. Prize of my happiness, she says, poor harmless blossom, thou must die. But while it perished in its youth, it looked so pitifully mild, that the fond maiden wept for Ruth, she too was but a blossom wild. Come listen to my mournful strain, a simple story, sweet and sad, this tale of one who loved in vain was told me by a harvest lad. The third day passed with twilight shade, the rich man to his barley came. Breathless and pale there stood the maid, her eyes triumphantly aflame. I did but jest, my girl, he cried, ten crowns thy toil will amply pay. Alas, one more frail blossom died, cut to the heart ere close of day. Such is the story, sad and sweet, I heard amid the golden grain. The maidens sing it when they meet, and mingle weeping with the strain. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Woman's Dream by Madame de Bourdet Valmore. Translated from the French by George Murray. Read for LibriVox.org by Anne Boulay. A Woman's Dream Wilt thou begin thy life once more, Woman, whose hair will soon be white? Wouldst thou thy childhood, as of yore, Flushed by its guardian angel's light? Rocked in a cradle to repose, Wilt thou thy mother's kisses greet? Yes, my lost Eden's gates unclose, Ah, yes, my God, it was so sweet. Trained by thy father's tender care, wilt thou love purity and truth, diffusing round thee everywhere the fragrant innocence of youth? Wilt thou to life's enchanting prime fly back with joy on pinion fleet? Would it last a longer time? Ah, yes, my God, it was so sweet. 
wilt thou thine ignorance resume and spell life's alphabet anew when hopes like stars thy path illume canst thou forget the storm that blew wouldst thou have back thy blossoms gay the doves that fluttered to thy call all but the gravestones by the way o oh, gracious god restore them all have then whate'er thy heart may crave thy doves thy blossoms and thy song time's stream with melancholy wave will reach the vale of tears ere long love thou hast felt to love return too frail its madness to defy must i again with passion burn nay pitying saviour let me die end of poem this recording is in the public domain Remembrance by Alfred de Musset, translated from the French by George Murray, read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. O sacred ground, in wandering back to thee, I thought to suffer, though I hoped to weep. Thou dearest grave, unhonored, save by me, where hallowed memories sleep. What find ye in this solitude to dread, my friends? Why draw me by the hand away, when habit grown so old and sweet? hath led my footsteps here to stray i see the uplands and the blooming heath the silvery pathway o'er the noiseless sand the walk still redolent of lover's breath where hand was clasped in hand the mountain gorges careless tracks i mark familiar murmurs once again i hear from ancient pine trees crowned with verdure dark that soothed my boyhood's ear here is the greenwood where my youth once more sings like a choir of birds upon a tree fair moorland where my mistress strayed of yore didst thou not look for me nay let them flow these welcome blissful tears that from a heart still bleeding take their rise and let the mist that veils long buried years refresh my aching eyes these woods are witness that i once was blessed through them no echoes of a dirge shall roll Proud is this forest in its peaceful rest, and proud too is my soul. With bitter cries let some bereaved one rave, who kneels despairing by a comrade's tomb. Here all breathes life, the flowerets of the grave, here cannot bud or bloom. Behold, the moon is rising o'er the glade, like land still trembles, lovely queen of night. But soon, dispelling the horizon's shade, thine orb shall glow with light as all the perfumes of the vanished day rise from the earth still moistened with the dew so from my chastened soul beneath thy ray old love is born anew where are the sorrows gone that made me pale and left me prematurely old with pain i grow while gazing on this friendly veil a joyous child again o oh, tender might of time o oh, fleeting hours ye stanch each tear and stifle each regret and in your pity on our faded flowers your feet are never set i bless thee time kind angel of relief i had not thought love's wound could e'er conceal anguish so keen or that a victim's grief could be so sweet to feel far be from me each time-worn thought and phrase that oft in heartless epitaphs are read wherewith the man who never loved displays his feelings for the dead Dante, thou saidst that in the hour of woe, remembered happiness is sorrow's curse. What grief was thine that thus could overflow in that embittered verse? Must we forget that ever in the skies, e'en when our night is darkest, light appears? Didst thou spurn sorrow, thou whose mournful eyes poured forth immortal tears? No, by yon moon whose beams illume my glance, that vaunted blasphemy was not thy creed remembered happiness on earth perchance may happiness succeed heaven on my head its lightnings now may fling this memory cannot from my heart be torn to this though wrecked by tempests i will cling like mariner forlorn and oft i murmur at this time and place i loved one day and i was loved again time has no power the picture to efface while life and thought remain End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Perhaps by George Murray. Read for LibriVox.org by Joe Brenneman. 
To horse, to horse, I mount with speed, For we must travel far, my steed, To find repose. Thy master's brain is crazed with care, And we must gallop apace, but where? Who knows? Oh, how that golden-haired coquette Dreamed she had caught me in the net Of her disdain. The siren is so fair, so cold, That the same kingdom cannot hold us twain. Around her castle walls each day My steed and I with spirits gay Were wont to roam. Yon path familiar grown to each We now must shun, or we should reach her home. Those faithless gods to which I bowed, Her charms that lured me, made her proud, Her hair, her eyes, Blue as the cloudless heaven above, Her lips that seemed to breathe of love in sighs. At length my heart hath burst its chain, And as my freedom I regain, I curse her pride, And to my lips that day by day Murmured, I love thee, now I say, ye lied. Shame on the heartless wayward elf, Who will not tenderly herself my passion share, But jealously refuses still To let me wander at my will elsewhere. On, on, my steed, tis just the hour That in the gloaming to her bower Her slave would bring. Now from the hateful spot I fly, And with no teardrop in my eye I sing. But what is here, the velvet lawn, Her home amid the shade withdrawn? It must be so. O thoughtless man, O heedless brute, That failed to recognize which route to go, Turn back, but no, stand still, for she Is smiling at the casement, see? Her finger taps, twere churlish not to say goodbye, When daylight dawns, my steed and I, Afar from Circe's bower will fly, perhaps. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. If, Darling, with Melodious Lay, by Victor Wilder, translated from the French by George Murray, read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. If, Darling, with Melodious Lay, in woodland's depths thou wert a bird, I fain would be the slender spray that thrills where'er thy voice is heard, or if thou wert a crimson flower that bears its heart to heaven above, then, like a golden bee each hour, I'd sip the honey of thy love. Wert thou, my love, a stately swan That floats upon some glassy lake, I'd be the waveless mere whereon No breeze thy cradled calm should break. Wert thou some star, when clouds are dark, A sentry o'er the world asleep, I then would be a poor frail bark For thee to pilot o'er the deep. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Lily and the Rose by Victorien Sardou Translated from the French by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia The Lily and the Rose From the French of Victorien Sardou A secret I wish to disclose, A mystery is hard to lay bare. We take, for example, a rose, and a lily with virginal air the lily said exquisite rose if i dared but i fear to propose then the rose murmured pray do not fear one must dare a little my dear and this is the way that the rose and the lily their feelings disclose the lily and rose in this way a subtle discretion display the lily then said i suppose her speech is abridged by design I would love, O oh, most exquisite rose, to mingle my perfume with thine. The rose answered, Nobody knows good reason your wish to oppose, but if such a wish is sincere, come closer a little, my dear. Thus matters soon came to a close between the coy lily and rose. The rose and the lily this way united to form a bouquet. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Le Muguet et la Rose 
by Victorien Sardou. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Le Muguet et la Rose par Victorien Sardou. Je vais vous débrouiller la chose et dévoiler ce grand secret. Voici, par exemple, une rose, une rose et un muguet. Le muguet dit « Oh, belle rose, si j'osais parler, mais je n'ose. » La rose dit tout bas « Mon Dieu, il faut pourtant oser un peu. » Voilà la façon dont on cause entre le muguet et la rose, et dont on joue au plus discret entre la rose et le muguet. Le muguet poursuit, je suppose, pour abréger les entretiens, que j'aimerais, charmante rose, amener mes parfums au tien. La rose dit, c'est une chose à laquelle rien ne s'oppose, mais pour satisfaire à ce vœu, il faut vous rapprocher un peu. Et voilà comment toute chose, entre le muguet et la rose, finit par un joli bouquet, fait de la rose et du muguet. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet by Felix Arvers Translated from French by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org There is a secret shrined within my soul, A deathless love in one brief moment born, A hopeless passion that I must control, And hide from her to whom its vows are sworn. Yes, I must pass unnoticed by her eye, Close by her side consumed by lonely thought, and shrouding still my secret I shall die, by not rewarded having sued for naught. But she, though God has dowered her with a sweet and tender nature, knows not that her feet lure me to follow her wherever they stray, too pure to dream her love can be desired. Were she to read these lines she has inspired, who is this lady, she would calmly say. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Week in a Boy's Life by Jacques Gesme Translated from the Provençal by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter 1. Chill was our sky, the swallows all had fled, A feeble glimmer by the sun was shed, the silent fields were lying bleak and bare when all saints day drew nigh and from each palsied bough on high the yellow leaves condemned to die dropped eddying slowly through the air two one evening from our peaceful town while countless stars were gazing down a brother and a sister strayed in melancholy mood and when before a cross they stood they innocently prayed bathed in the moonlight's purity Abel and Rose long bent the knee, then like some organ in a fane, the mournful voices of the twain poured forth two prayers that blent in one, and soared to heaven in unison. Mother of Christ, benignant maid, father at home lies sick with pain. Oh, send thine angel to his aid, so shall our mother smile again, and we thy children will adore, and love thee, sweetest virgin, more and more. The virgin could not slight the prayer. Scarce had they reached their home, when from a door that opened there, a woman, youthful still and fair, with joy beheld them come. Poor darlings, death hath turned aside, the fever is subdued, and since your father hath not died, show God, dear lambs, your gratitude. So kneeling on the bare, rude planks of a poor garret they gave thanks, beside a bed, with surge or spread, whereon with cool and painless brow, Hilaire, the honest father, lay, a soldier in his youthful day, a humble mason now. 3. The morrow dawned with smiling gleam, the sunlight once again was soon illuming with its beam, each patched up window pane, when Abel came with noiseless tread, stole forward to his father's bed, and oped the curtain by his head he newly waked beheld his son with joy and cried i looked for thee remain my boy our home is poor my toil procures us food god for your sakes has spared me god is good for thou art young not fifteen quite thou knowest how to read and write but thou art coy and grave and prone to dream still life is work for every one i deem i know that thou art delicate and frail less strong than comely 
and thine arms would fail to smite the stone with sinews hail but our collector wise and kind notes that thy manners are refined and to befriend thee seems inclined go then and do his bidding but no sloth and no conceit my boy leave that to fools writer and artisan are workmen both pens hammers are their tools mind like the body wears our life away enough dear child i trust that thou dressed in black cloth wilt ne'er allow false pride to scorn thy father's mean array abel's blue eyes were lifted up with joy fond kisses passed between the man and boy mother and sister also had their share next morn the stripling to his patron went and for four days that followed their content was boundless as the air four alas the pleasures of the poor are brief the sabbath morning brought a mandate stern hilaire to-morrow must to work return if he be absent in that case another hand will take his place by order of the chief the volley from a cannon fired no deeper anguish doles than by this message was inspired within four wretched souls i'm cured the father cries and struggles hard to rise but falls back feebly if he works he dies a week of rest is wanted ah poor friend thy life and death upon thy toil depend all four were mute through abel's heart a thought like lightning seemed to dart it dried the tears within his eyes and lent the boy a nobler mien strength in each muscle seemed to rise while blushes on his cheek were seen then forth he fared and quickly went to the rough foreman's tenement soon he returned his heart no more by sore distress was wrung ne'er had he looked so gay before smiles in his eyes and honey on his tongue rest father rest thou hast a week of grace rest from thy toil thy wonted vigour gain a friend that loves thee will supply the place which thou mayst still retain five saved by a friend so friends still love and feel well this were certain in our world of woes to-morrow's light the secret will reveal good sons exist but friends alas who knows tis monday morn our able drudges hard not at the desk but in the builder's yard his sire was wrong for though he seems to be so frail his work is as the work of three deftly he crumbles up the lime and kneads the mortar for each wall light as a bird he loves to climb till the pale workmen tremble for his fall he walks a dizzy platform with the best smiles as he mounts and smiles when he alights here there and everywhere no task he slights but toils to save his father and is blessed and thus his honest comrades there who guessed the secret of the boy watched while the sweat uncurled his sunny hair and clapped their hands with tearful joy six what bliss for abel when at close of day the workmen homeward press he quickly doffs his spattered dress and dons his black array then three fond traitors all conspire to cheat the unsuspecting sire who hails his son's arrival from the desk abe prates of bills and contracts in burlesque and with an artful wink replies whenever his conscious mother winks her eyes so past three days the patient quits his bed life seems more sweet an unfamiliar boon thursday his malady has fled friday he gaily quits the house at noon but friday god created thee for woe cheered by the sunshine's welcome heat hilaire speeds onward vexed at seeming slow he yearns his friend in substitute to greet he longs his name to know seven and now the house is nigh but no one stands on high and yet the bell for dinner has not rung great heaven what crowds are at the building's base foremen mechanics neighbors old and young but why a man has fallen oh piteous case his friend perchance his soul is on the rack he runs the workmen shudder at the sight and strive to keep him back he elbows through with frenzied might oh helpless sire oh horror wild the friend that saved him is his darling child he finds him toppled from a scaffold's height stretched almost dead upon the bloody ground and while the father shrieks for fright to aid his son all sadly cluster round alas the boy who dies past aiding only sighs master i could not quite work out my week 
one day is lost but in poor mother's name thy pity for my father i bespeak men wept to hear the fond pathetic claim at length the sufferer turns his eyes upon his father bends his face towards him for a moment's space petitioning a last embrace fondles his hand and smiling softly dies eight they kept his place for lone hilaire they proffered goodly pay alas too late his only care was soon to pass away no gold his sorrow could efface no skill his life could save he went to take another place beside his darling's grave End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Fantasy by George Murray. Read for LibriVox.org by Joe Brenneman. There is an air that haunts me till I slight the witching strains of Weber and Mozart, an air that floods with languorous delight the secret chambers of my lonely heart. Each time I listen to that music old, I seem to live two hundred years ago. Tis Louis Trizé who reigns, and I behold green uplands golden in the sunset's glow. Then a tall palace, gray with granite towers, and countless window panes that redly glare, girt by broad parks through which, mid bloom of flowers, a glassy river wanders here and there. And then a lady opes a casement high, pale with dark eyes, in antique robes arrayed, one whom I loved in centuries gone by, whose image never from my soul can fade. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Forget Me Not by Alfred de Musset Translated from the French by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson Remember me when morn with trembling light Opes her enchanted palace to the sun. Remember me when the silver-mantled night In silence passes like a pensive nun. Whene'er with ecstasy thy bosom heaves Or dreams beguile thee in the summer eves, then from the woodland lone hear a low whispered tone forget me not remember me when unrelenting fate hath forced us to forevermore to part when years of exile leave me desolate and sorrow blights this fond despairing heart think of my hapless love my last farewell absence and time true passion cannot quell. And while the heart still beats, each throb for thee repeats, Forget me not. Remember me when neath the chilly tomb My weary heart is wrapped in slumber deep. Remember me when pale flowerets bloom O'er the green turf that shrouds my dreamless sleep. I shall not see thee, but from realms above my soul shall watch thee with a sister's love, and oft when none are nigh, a voice at night shall sigh, Forget me not. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Jacques by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Jacques In Paris at the dawn of light, To work two masons hide, And mounting to a scaffold's height, Their labor briskly plied. Soon their frail foothold in the air Cracked, threatening to give way, Too weak the weight of two to bear, For one a trembling stay. Jacques, cried his mate, I have a wife and children three alive farewell said jacques and gave his life a sacrifice for five o hero known as jacques to fame that deeds unselfish love in full we trust shall cause thy name to be inscribed above End of poem. 
This recording is in the public domain. The Maiden of Otaheite by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia The Maiden of Otaheite Suggested by a poem of Victor Hugo And wilt thou fly me? Must thy fickle sail soon waft thee hence before the favouring gale? From my quick senses I would fain conceal the nameless trifles which the truth reveal. My jealous eyes confirm my boding heart. I cannot doubt that thou wilt soon depart. This very eve, while roaming over the wet and shell-strewn beach, where we so oft have met, thou dost remember well the giant cave, there we would sit and hear old ocean rave. I saw thy ship at anchor in the bay, clean, bright and trim, as for some holiday. I watched thy sailors folding many a tent, I heard their shouts with songs and laughter blend. I guessed the cause of all their glee and crept within our cave, where bitterly I wept. Why quit our isle? Around thine island home doth ocean more magnificently foam? Are the blue skies more exquisitely clear? Is there less sorrow in thy clime than here? Are the flowers fairer, or the trees more grand? Do brighter shells and pebbles deck the strand? Or if by sickness thou shouldst stricken be, Will far-off friends more fondly wait on thee? Hast thou forgotten when the zephyr bore Thy weary vessel to our welcome shore? I gazed upon thee as upon some star, And thou didst call me to the woods afar. Twas the first time I saw thy smiling eyes, and yet I came obedient to thy cries. Then I was beautiful, but beauty's flower fades, droops and withers in one stormy hour, and so with me. Salt bitter tears, in truth, have marred my comeliness, O stranger youth. But if thou stayest, I will bloom again, as flowers revive in sunshine after rain stay then sweet stranger bid me not farewell tales of thy tender mother thou shalt tell and sing the ballads of thy native land that thou hast taught me half to understand to thee i yield myself to thee who art my being's breath the life-blood of my heart who fillest all my days whose form of light haunts my rapt soul in visions of the night whose very life is so involved with mine that my last hour must be the same as thine. Alas, thou goest! On thy natal hills perchance some virgin for thy coming thrills. Tis well, still deign, O master, deign to take thy slave along with thee. For thy dear sake, even to thy bride I will submissive prove, if thy delight be centred in her love. Far from my birthplace and my parents old, whose fond affection never can be told, far from the woods, where scared by no alarms, when thou didst call, I sank into thy arms. Far from my flowers and palm trees, I may sigh, but here, by thee deserted, I shall die. If ever thou didst love me in the past, hear now my prayer. It is the first and last. Frown not upon me. Thou wast wont to smile. Fly not without me to thy cherished isle, lest my sad ghost, when death has stilled my heart, should hover round thee, wheresoever thou art. Day dawned, and reddened the receding sails of a great ship, far distant out at sea. Her playmates sought the maiden in her tent, but never more beneath the forest boughs, or on the shore of ocean was she seen. The gentle girl no longer wept, but still, she was not with the stranger out at sea. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Une femme by Heinrich Heine, translated from the German by Gerard de Nerval, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Une femme, translated from the German of Heine by Gerard de Nerval. Ils s'aimaient tous deux tendrement. Elle était voleuse, et lui filou. Lorsqu'ils commettaient quelques coups de main, elle se jetait sur le lit, et riait. Le jour se passait en joie et en bonbons. La nuit, elle reposait sur sa poitrine. 
Lorsqu'on le mena en prison, elle se mit à la fenêtre et riait. Il lui écrit « Oh, reviens à moi, je soupire après ta présence, je t'appelle du fond du cœur et je languis. » Lorsqu'elle reçut la lettre, elle secoua la tête et riait. Vers six heures du matin, il fut pendu. À sept heures, on le jeta dans la fosse. Mais elle, une heure après, buvait du vin rouge et riait. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Woman by Gérard de Nerval Translated from the French by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia A Woman Translated from the French of Gérard de Nerval They loved each other in joy or grief. He was a sharper and she a thief. At each new tale of her lover's craft, she fell on her pillow and gaily laughed. All night they reveled with mirth and jest, all night she slumbered upon his breast. They dragged him to jail like a creature daft. She stood at the window and gaily laughed. He wrote her a letter, Oh, come to me, I sigh for thy presence, I pine for thee. She read each word of the ill-scrawled draft, then shook her head and still gaily laughed. At six he was hanged in the sight of heaven, his body was flung in a ditch at seven, and at eight in the morning his mistress quaffed a bumper of wine and still gaily laughed. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Delivered by Anders Abraham Grafström. Translated from the Swedish by George Murray. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter The night was chilly, home Gunnar spread with bark from the pine trees torn. Fain would he mix it with flour for bread, but flour there is none in his lowly shed, in his barn not a grain of corn. Two pale thin children with looks of woe to welcome their father run. Some bread, dear father, we hunger so, a crumb or two in thy love bestow. God pity you, I have none. When mother was born on the rude black bier, and her coffin was downward cast, into a pit in the churchyard drear, a loaf you gave us, twas wet with a tear. Say, father, was that the last? My children, to-day I can give you naught, but God will allay your sorrow. In calm meek trust should his grace be sought, he will soon send aid of his kind forethought, perhaps we will bake to-morrow. He snatched his harp from the mossy wall. What magic is in its strains? For bread those starved ones no longer call, And tears from their pale cheeks cease to fall, As the melody soothes their pains. He turned his face that would else betray The tokens of anguish deep, And he played them some music so wildly gay That the children danced and night wore away, Till wearied they fell asleep. Then he prayed by the pallet, whereon the twain lay sleeping with tranquil breath. Save them, O friend of the poor, from pain. God listened, they never awoke again. The deliverer came. It was death. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To Ninon by Alfred de Moussy Translated from the French by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter If I should dare my passion to reveal, What would your answer be, blue-eyed brunette? You know what pain love's victims ever feel. E'en you your pity cannot all conceal. Still, you would doubtless make me feel regret. Were I to say that silent I have pined Six weary months with all a lover's woe, Ninon, your careless subtlety of mind may, like a witch, my secret have divined, and you, perchance, would answer me, I know. Were I the pleasing madness to confess that makes me, shadow-like, your steps pursue, a look of sweet incredulous distress, Ninon, you know enhances loveliness, your lips perchance would murmur, is it true? Were I to tell you that my tongue can name each airy syllable you spoke last night, Ninon, you know your glances, when they blame, Change eyes of azure into eyes of flame. Your wrath perchance would drive me from your sight. 
were i to tell you that on bended knee each night i pray despairing all the while Nino, you know that when you smile a bee in your red lips a blossom well might see were i to tell you you perchance would smile but i refrain in silence seated near your beauty by the lamplight i adore i breathe your fragrance and your voice i hear but you will find no cause to be severe though all my looks you doubtingly explore i dwell within a region of romance at eve your songs are all on earth i heed your hands with harmony my soul entrance or in the joyous whirlwind of the dance i feel your lithe form tremble like a reed when envious night has forced me to depart and all your charms are ravished from my view quick through my brain a thousand memories dart and like some miser i unlock my heart a treasured casket filled alone for you i love but coldly i can still reply i love the secret i alone can tell sweet is the secret dear each stifled sigh for i have sworn to love though hopelessly not without bliss i see you it is well i was not born for happiness supreme with you to live and in your arms to die e'en my despair to teach me this would seem still if i told you of my passion's dream who knows adored one what you might reply end of poem this recording is in the public domain In Futuro by George Murray, read for LibriVox.org by Joe Brenneman. Eaten now from mountain or from plain, in France, America, or Spain, a tree is soaring, oak or pine, of which some portion shall be mine. Eaten now within her chamber alone, some wrinkled and decrepit crone weaves fair white linen like a fate to clothe my body soon or late e'en now for me with sunless toil like some blind mole beneath a soil a swarthy miner doth explore earth's teeming veins for iron ore there is some corner of the earth where naught but loveliness hath birth where sunbeams drink the tears of morn there i shall sleep in days unborn that tree which with its foliage now doth screen a nest on every bough the planks hereafter shall supply wherein my coffin bones shall lie that linen which the wrinkled crone is weaving in her chamber lone shall form a winding sheet to hold my lifeless body in its fold that iron burrowed from the soil by the swart miner's sunless toil transformed to nails shall tightly close the chest wherein my limbs repose and in that charming spot on earth where naught but loveliness hath birth a grave shall yawn beneath whose sod my heart shall mingle with the clod end of poem this recording is in the public domain. A Dead Woman by Alfred de Musset Translated from the French by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Yes, she was beauteous, If the night by Michael's chisel wrought A marble monument to sleep Can beautiful be thought. And she was good, if goodness be devoid of heart and cold if love be shewn by alms alone if charity be gold she thought if words and dulcet tones significant of naught vague as the murmur of a stream deserve the name of thought she prayed if prayer it can be called to fix two lustrous eyes now meekly downward on the earth now upward on the skies she smiled if e'er the virgin bud, with heart unclosed as yet, Smiles to the zephyrs of the spring that pass it and forget. She might have wept, if dews divine that soften human clay Could ever to her chilly breast have found some secret way. She might have loved, 
but scorn and pride kept watch about her heart like lamps that o'er a coffined form their useless radiance dart now she who only seemed to live but had no life is dead and from her hands the book is dropped in which she never read end of poem this recording is in the public domain an evening scene by victor hugo translated from the french by george murray read for LibriVox.org by sonia an evening scene here all is joy and all is light the spider with untiring tread ties to the tulip's turban bright his circling maze of silvery thread the quivering dragonfly appears proud to behold her round dark eyes glassed in the limpid stream that rears a world of breathing mysteries the full-blown rose grown young again to blushing buds her love avows the birds pour forth their evening strain of melody from sunlit boughs far in the woods where silence dwells the timid fawn securely dreams mid emerald moss with velvet cells like burnished gold the beetle gleams pale as some sweet consumptive maid regaining life the moon doth rise dispelling every cloud or shade with radiance from her opal eyes the wallflower that to ruin clings now frolics with the wandering bee the furrow feels each germ that springs neath the warm earth and laughs with glee all lives and plays its part with grace the sunbeam on the portal's sill the shadow on the water's face the blue sky over the verdant hill field glen and forest share the whole of nature's ecstasy and rest fear nothing man creation's soul knows the whole secret and is blessed end of poem this recording is in the public domain Christmas by Théophile Gautier, translated from the French by George Murray, read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. The heavens are black, the earth is white. Ring out wild joy bells to the skies. Jesus is born. The virgin bright bends o'er him with enraptured eyes. Around the mystic infant's head no fold of slumbrous curtain streams. Only the spider's airy thread drops from the stable's dusty beams. The baby nestling in the straw thrills with the cold in every limb. The ox and ass in seeming awe kneel down and warmly breathe on him. O'er that thatched hovel in the night heaven opens dazzling as the morn while bands of angels clothed in white sing to the shepherds christ is born end of poem this recording is in the public domain memories by henri merger translated from the french by george murray read for LibriVox.org by thomas peter hast thou louise forgotten yet that nook within the garden old where when the summer sun had set my hand would oft thy hand enfold with beating hearts we sat beneath the shadows of the willow trees few words escaped our trembling breath dost thou remember still louise hast thou marie forgotten yet the fond exchange of rings we made the sunlit meadows where we met, The woodlands full of song and shade. A fount that musically fell in marble basin Marks the spot where oft we lingered. Marie, tell, is that sweet trysting place forgot? Christine, hast thou forgotten quite Our fragrant room with roses gay? Twas somewhat near the sky, but bright On April morns and eves of May, those calm, clear eves, when planets pale seemed whispering to thee, Earthly queen, like us, thy beauty's light unveil. Dost thou remember still, Christine? Louise is dead, 
poor font marie is worse alas than dead they say and pale christine across the sea to sunnier climes hath sailed away marie louise christine all three though ne'er forgotten now forget our loves are dead eternally and i alone remember yet end of poem this recording is in the public domain Tit for Tat by Dufresnoy Translated from French by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org Phyllis, a venal nymph, delayed Poor Damon's hope of bliss Until the lovesick swain had paid Ten sheep to buy a kiss. Next day, ashamed to cheat the boy, She sold her favors cheap, And Damon bought with eager joy Ten kisses for a sheep. Next morning, of her own accord, afraid his love to miss, the sheep to Damon she restored, eleven for a kiss. At eve, half wild with jealousy, she gladly would have bought, with all her flock the kiss that he gave Rosalind for naught. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Flower and the Butterfly by Victor Hugo, translated from the French by George Murray, read for LibriVox.org by Anne Boulay. The Flower and the Butterfly Once to the butterfly a floweret sighed, One moment stay, our fates are severed, Here on earth I bide, thou must away. Still we both love, and far from human tread, We pass the hours, each like the other, for by man tis said, we both are flowers. Earth chains me down, thy path is in the skies, O oh, cruel lot, or thee I fain would breathe my perfume sighs, they reach thee not. Thou rovest far, mid blooms fair and sweet, thy life is glad, I watch the shadow turning at my feet, alone and sad. Thy form now quivers near, now flits away and disappears, but thou wilt find me at each dawn of day, all bathed in tears. If tis thy will our love should lasting be, O truant king, like me take root, or let me soar, like thee, on splendid wing. Lenoir, roses and butterflies, and death you meet, or soon or late, would not your lives together pass be sweet, then wherefore wait? Somewhere above the earth, if floating up, thy pinions soar, or in the meads, if there perchance thy cup, its fragrance pour. What matters where, be thou a breath alone, or tint of spring, a radiant butterfly, or rose half blown, a flower or wing, to live together, this your fondest aim, your vital need, chance may be left your future home to name, the sky, the mead. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To My Old Coat by Béranger, translated from the French by George Murray, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. To My Old Coat Wear well, poor coat, that time endears, together we are growing old. My hand has brushed thee ten long years, can more of Socrates be told? If fate aggressively still tries, thy patched and threadbare stuff to rend, resist, like me, philosophize. We must not part, my dear old friend. How fondly I recall the day when first I wore thee, twas my fate, and friends who hailed my spruce array sang songs thy praise to celebrate. Thy poor old age, of which I boast, true comrades never can offend. Oft still myself and thee they toast. We must not part, my dear old friend. Have I debased thee with perfume, that warns when simpering fops are near, or cringing in some ante-room expose thee to a patron's sneer. For ribbons that the wise man scorns, all France is eager to contend. A rose thy buttonhole adorns, we must not part, my dear old friend. No longer fear those reckless days, when kindred destinies were ours, days when we shared the blame and praise, the joy and sorrow, sun and showers. My need of tailors I foresee, 
is not far distant from an end we'll end together wait for me we soon must part my dear old friend end of poem this recording is in the public domain a ballad by andre van hasselt translated from the french by george murray read for LibriVox.org by sonia a ballad o restless swallow thou whose wings skim the gray clouds in sportive rings hast thou beheld my own true knight fair dame he has not blessed my sight gay lark that soarest far on high a lessening speck amid the sky say hast thou marked the form i love my glance hath i been turned above thou wood beneath whose leafy dome soft murmurs of the summer roam here did my lover chance to stray no foot hath trod my path to-day aerial crag on whose dim crest the eagle strews her careless nest hath horse or horseman met thine eye no cavalier hath ridden by white foaming torrent tell me where my warrior with the golden hair over thy dark waters did he leap down in their depths he lies asleep end of poem this recording is in the public domain rondeau by jean froissart translated from the french by george murray read for librivox .org by sonia Rondeau. come back sweet friend too long thou art away my heart is pained while thou dost absent stay i yearn for thee each moment of the day come back sweet friend too long thou art away for till thou comest wherefore then delay i have not any one to make me gay come back sweet friend too long thou art away my heart is pained when thou dost absent stay End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Grave and the Rose by Victor Hugo, translated from the French by George Murray, read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. The Grave said, Rose, so bright of hue, what dost thou with the drops of dew that bathe thy buds each day? The Rose replied, O solemn grave, with all that fills thy hungry cave, what doest thou, I pray? From the sweet tears of morn that roll into my heart, the very soul of fragrance I distill. The grave then answered, All that lies entombed, hereafter shall arise, God's paradise to fill. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ultima Spes Mortuorum by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org by Anne Boulay 1. The bells will ring tomorrow for the day, held sacred to the dead, and those who slumber in their shrouds of clay will quit their narrow bed. Then shades invisible to mortal eye, arising from the tomb, will flit beneath the sycamores that sigh amid funereal gloom chilled by the breeze those shivering phantoms stray while heaven is dark above and still by hope inspirited they say we wait for those we love their warm true hearts our absence still deplore and soon in dark array a pilgrim band our cherished friends of yore above each cross will pray and they will offer to our memory true affection simple boon kind hands immortales on each mound will strew that fade alas so soon two why from thy cerements shake the dust away why come to tremble neath our misty skies what sound disturbed within your beds of clay the slumberous calm that weighed upon your eyes shades of the dead ye viewless spectres tell why cross the threshold of the earth again what hope ye from this world wherein we dwell since in your grave clothes still ye hope in vain ye come your confidence in man to test and ye will carry back into your bed the sad conviction bitterly confessed that from oblivion naught can save the dead three 
the day profundus pealed its solemn tones and the good man of god prayed while the sexton hid your coffin bones beneath the hallowed sod parents and sisters friends and lovers all whom at the final hour your dying lips had kissed were round the pall regretful tears to shower and all when blessings with your latest breath to each in turn were given while ye were waiting for the call of death to wing your flight to heaven all fondly promised weeping in despair that from each faithful heart your memories sanctified by daily prayer should never more depart come then to-day your prison portals ope your resting places leave eternal victims of eternal hope come wait in vain till eve four the ghosts are flitting restlessly beneath the cypress trees they list tis nothing but the sigh of some autumnal breeze but still those phantoms list each sound that breathes the lonely walks around long but in vain they wait to hear the tread of human footstep near then shedding bitter tears of sorrow they whisper they will come to-morrow lord thou well knowest that they will not come that those hapless ghosts will oft return to seek some simple offering at their tomb for which they vainly evermore will yearn to thee the cruel irony is known whatever dies is soon oblivion's prey and tears that answered every dying groan e'en at the grave are calmly wiped away lord thou dost know that o'er the world to-day the love of self triumphantly doth reign that should this curse defer some souls to slay sooner or later they must still be slain lord thou well knowest that the human race is sick at heart and weary to the death pursuing hope in everlasting chase until we murmur with our dying breath at last we greet the silence of repose blue sky or black to us it matters not calmly we slumber disregarding woes expecting not for all is now forgot and yet o oh, mockery the rest we crave is still disturbed within our final bed hope faithless spectre penetrates the grave and by the living spurned deludes the dead End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Grandmother by Victor Hugo, translated from the French by George Murray, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Grandmother, dear mother of our mother, dost thou sleep? Thy voice was wont to murmur many a tone of rapt devotion, even in slumber deep breathless this eve thou liest here alone with lips all motionless a form of stone why on thy bosom droops thy wrinkled brow what have we done to cause that seeming ire the lamp burns dim the ashes glimmer low and shouldst thou answer not the smouldering fire the lamp and we thy two will all expire by the dim lamp thy children soon will die and thou by slumber's spell no more oppressed wilt call on those who may not hear thy cry and thou long time wilt fold us to thy breast and strive with prayer to stir us from our rest in our warm hands thy chilly fingers place sing lays of troubadours dead long ago of warriors aided by the fairy race who chanted love amid the battle's glow and decked their brides with trophies from the foe tell us the signs that scatter ghosts in flight what hermit viewed hell's swift careering lord tell of the gnome king's rubies sparkling bright and if the psalms of turpin are aboard by the black demon more than roland's sword show us thy bible filled with pictures fair saints robed in white who guard each hamlet low virgins with golden glories round their hair or read the pages where we long to know each mystic word that breathes to god our woe soon from all light thy children will be shut round the black hearth the frolic shadows dance and airy shapes may steal within the hut thou frightest us thy love is changed perchance o oh, cease thy prayer awaken from thy trance unseal those eyes o oh god thine arms are cold oft hast thou told us of the glorious sky of the damp grave and life that waxeth old and oft of death what is it then to die 
tell us dear mother thou dost not reply with plaintive voices long they wailed alone the sleeper woke not when the morning shone the death bell slowly tolling seemed to grieve and through the door a passer-by at eve by the still couch and pictured bible sees two little children praying on their knees End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Terrors of Death, written on the walls of a Carthusian monastery, by Théophile Gautier, translated from the French by George Murray, read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. Thou who dost pace this cloistered hall, reflect on death. Thou canst not know if e'er again thy form shall throw its changeful shadow on the wall. It may be that these very stones which thou, regardless of the dead, to-day with sandaled foot dost tread, shall press to-morrow on thy bones. Life, like a frail, thin plank, conceals eternity's abyss profound. A gulf yawns suddenly around, the panic-stricken sinner reels. The earth recedes on which he trod. What finds he now? Heaven blue and calm, or hell's red blaze? The victor's palm, or torment? Lucifer, or God? Oh, ponder well the thought of dread, And let thy prescient spirit view thyself, As with cadaverous hue thou liest stretched upon a bed, Betwixt two sheets, whereof the one shall form the shroud to wrap thy clay, Sad raiment all must wear some day albeit coveted by none by fever parched or numbed by cold writhing like green wood in the fire while inarticulate words expire upon thy lips thyself behold thou pantest like a stag at bay death rattles hoarsely in thy throat foreboding with sepulchral note the soul's desertion of the clay Dark vestured priests in silent steel within thy room with oil and picks and bearing each a crucifix around thy lowly pallet kneel behold too praying for thy soul thy wife and children love so well the ringer of the passing bell hangs on the rope thy knell to toll the sexton hollows with his spade a narrow bed thy bones to hold and soon the fresh brown crumbling mould shall fill the pit where thou art laid thy flesh so delicate and fair shall serve the charnel worms to feed and brightly tint each flower and weed upon thy grave with verdure rare fit then thy soul that hour to meet when thou shalt draw thy latest breath my brother bitter is the death of him whose life hath been too sweet end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Red Breast by George Murray, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Red Breast, a legend of Brittany. When Jesus meekly passed to death and bore the cursed rood, with faltering limbs and failing breath and brow bedewed with blood, a small bird hovering in the air flew down and strove in vain with feeble strength but pious care to soothe the Saviour's pain. The only thorn its love could wrest from out his ruthless crown pierced sharply through its gentle breast and crimsoned all the down. Ages have passed, but since that deed, the bird with crimson breast, O oh, sweetly superstitious creed, is loved by man the best. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Angel and the Child by Jean Rebul, translated from the French by George Murray, read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. An angel watched with radiant face a cradled infant's dream, seeming his own bright form to trace as in some crystal stream. Sweet image of myself, he cried, fair cherub, come with me. Far we will journey side by side, earth is no home for thee here bliss is mixed with base alloy pain pleasure underlies grief echoes in each tone of joy 
and rapture has its size. Fear at each banquet sits a guest, earth's calmest sabbath fails, to pledge the future, or arrest tomorrow's raging gales. Say then, shall gloomy woes and fears to vex thy soul arise? Oh, must the bitterness of tears bedim thine azure eyes? No, through the fields of space with me thy soul may soar content. God claims no more those days from thee thou shouldst on earth have spent. But let no sable robes by pale and weeping friends be worn. Death's hour as gladly they should hail as that when thou wast born. Pain for thy loss should leave no scar, thy doom should cloud no brow. The last day is the fairest far to beings pure as thou. The seraph spake, and then, with white resplendent wings outspread, To realms eternal took his flight. Mother, thy son was dead. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. What the Swallows Say by Théophile Gautier Translated from the French by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia what the swallows say dry leaves drop silently and cover the turf no longer fresh and green fair weather now alas is over the breeze at morn and eve is keen but ere the autumn days are ended earth's latest treasures charm the sight the dahlia's full cockade is splendid the marigold is flaming bright in bubbling drops the rain is beating on every fountain while on high the swallows hold a monster meeting to prate of winter now so nigh by hundreds they have flocked together concerting plans to flee the cold one says tis always charming weather at athens on the rampart old there on the parthenon i've wintered for many a year in peaceful rest and where a cannon-ball has splintered a pillar's freeze i make my nest another cries i hang my chamber within a turkish cafe's walls where hajis count their beads of ember and sunshine over the threshold falls i come i go i find no trouble mid latakia's vapours white and while the long nargiles bubble i skim gay turbans in my flight a third in baalbek's temple splendid a triglyph yields me shelter warm there lightly by my claws suspended I screen my gaping chicks from harm. A fourth. In future, my address is Rhodes, once with knightly warriors filled. Beneath the capital's recesses, on some black column I shall build. A fifth one twitters. I am fearful, age won't permit me far to fly. Still, Malta's terraces are cheerful, between blue water and blue sky. A sixth. For me, the land of Pharaoh, I'll paste an ornament with loam, high on a minaret of Cairo, and thus secure my winter home. The last one. Soon I shall be flitting above the second cataract. A granite monarch there is sitting, for swallows' nests expressly cracked. Then all exclaim, With tireless motion, tomorrow we shall voyage over brown plains, white peaks, and purple ocean, whose foaming billows fringe the shore. With quick shrill cries and wings aflutter, on the tall roofs and narrow eaves, such is the talk the swallows utter, scared by the autumn's reddening leaves. I can interpret all their prattle, each poet is a bird of light, though like a captive doomed to battle, with powers unseen that check his flight. Then, oh for pinions, airy pinions, as Rickard's charming verses sing, to rove each year over earth's dominions with swallows to eternal spring. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. An Appeal for the Deaf and Dumb by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Deaf not a murmur or a loving word can ever reach his ear. The raging sea, the pealing thunder, and the cannon's roar to him are silent. 
quite, silent as the grave, not quite, for ever when God takes away, he gives in other shape, the tramp of feet, the crash of falling things, the waves of sound strike on a deaf man's feelings with a force to us unknown. Vibrations of the air play through his frame on sympathetic nerves, like fine-strung instruments of varied tone. Dumb, not a murmur or a loving word can ever pass his lips. The cry of rage, the voice of friendship and the vows of love freeze on his tongue, so impotent of sound. But deem not that intelligence is null in that doomed mortal. Gaze upon his eye, a speaking eye, an eye that seems to hear, in by observing, and that gathers more from flickering lights and shadows of a face than duller minds can gain from spoken words. The age of miracles hath passed, but man can summon art and science to his aid and cause the faculties of sight and touch to act imperfectly for speech and ear the deaf-mute seems by nature formed to be a delicate artificer and skilled in subtle operations of the hand he can be taught to read and thus to learn the story of the present and the past or by quick signs to share his inmost thoughts chiefly with those for whom he yearneth most his fellow-sufferers nay it sometimes haps that men, like Kitto, reft of senses twain, have by their lore electrified the world, and won the crown of literary fame. Spare not your gifts, ye wealthy of the land, to these afflicted brethren, ye to whom heaven grants that sweetest of all blessings, health, and the keen joys of each corporeal sense, Aid those to whom these blessings are denied, and shed some sunshine o'er their gloomy lives. Let us all tread, as closely as we can, in the blessed footprints of that Holy One, who went about forever doing good, making the dumb to speak, the deaf to hear. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Gondolit by George Murray, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Gondolit, kiss the red lips of thy mistress today. Tomorrow, who knows? Thou mayst sleep with the dead. Love while the heart in thy bosom is gay. Love while thy blood is a flame that is red. Gray hairs, they say, are the pale flowers of death. Blood turns to ice, or but sluggishly flows. Time the remorseless will soon with his breath quench the wild fire that exultingly glows. Into my gondola step from the shore, under its roof we are free from alarms. Veiled are the windows and closed is the door, nobody sees thee, my love, in my arms. Nobody watches our infinite bliss, gently we rock on the waters that heave. Like the fond wavelets we toy and we kiss, mingling caresses this midsummer eve love then while youth thrilling passion inspires age soon with snow will extinguish its fires end of poem this recording is in the public domain the stranger by madame emile de girardin translated from the french by george murray read for librivox .org by sonia the stranger he passed from vision like a cloud or wave that onward sweeps my heart that once was cold and proud his image keeps one keen but fascinating glance enthralled my spellbound eyes and since that moment of romance life's breath i prize too daring and too rapturous my self-communing seem i love him and to love him thus is joy supreme and yet in lonely hours alas mine eyes with tears are dim to think my youthful years may pass apart from him he was the soul of which i dreamed for which i vainly pine the long-sought sister soul that seemed the twin of mine and i had found it o oh, my heart thy throbbings i must quell tis hard from all we love to part and cry farewell 
but still if pitying heaven will deign to aid us from above hereafter i shall meet again my only love one moment let me hear him sigh and feel his fond caress even were i doomed that hour to die from joy's excess end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Old Year by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Good night, old year, good night. The calm pale moon is watching in the sky, and the stars look down unutterably bright, each like a seraph's eye. They mourn thee not, they will not veil their fire, for they have seen six thousand years expire. Good night, old year, good night. I feel like one who weeps beside a bed, knowing full surely that the morrow's light will find his comrade dead, his comrade dead. O oh, solemn words of fate, e'en at their sound the heart sings desolate. Good night, old year, good night. The moaning winds thy requiem murmur low, and like a corpse arrayed in garments white, thou liest draped in snow, and thy young heir when scarce thy breath hath flown, will gallop up to seize upon his own. Good night, old year, good night. We knew that thou must die. The hectic flush that tinged thy cheek in autumn like a blight told of death's coming hush, and musing mournfully from day to day we watched the languid progress of decay. Good night, old year, good night. We bless thee for the blessings that thy hand hath scattered freely, as the sun doth light, o'er each too thankless land. If sometimes we have murmured at our lot, old year, we pray thee, oh, record it not. Good night, old year, good night. Think how we strove the tempter to repel. Think of our aspirations for the right. And if, alas, we fell, recall those words the Holy One did speak. The soul is willing, but the flesh is weak. Good night, old year, good night. I trow that no man liveth on the earth, Who, as thy spirit calmly takes its flight, Would vent discordant mirth. For tis a solemn thing, while tolls the knell, To bid the year eternally farewell. Good night, old year, good night. To some thou wast ambassador of woe, for with thee stalked the phantom death to smite their loved ones like a foe let such not curse thee they should kiss the rod for thou wast but the messenger of god good night old year good night mourners whose grief is bitter to endure should hail with joy thy heavenward tending flight for if their faith be sure each moment wafts them nearer to that shore where death and tears and parting are no more good night old year good night thy son the new year waiteth at the door and in his hand rich gifts he graspeth tight three hundred and threescore let us all greet him blithely as a friend and wait god's will with patience till the end end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Horoscope by Francois Coppé, translated from the French by George Murray, read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. Two sisters there, whose arms were interlaced, stood to consult a fortune-telling hag, while she, with wrinkled fingers, slowly placed the fatal cards upon an outspread rag. Brunette and blonde, both fresh as morning's hour, a poppy brown, a white anemone, one like a maybud, one an autumn flower, both yearned alike their destiny to see. Sorrow, alas, my child, thy life must fill, the old witch murmured to the proud brunette. The girl inquired, but will he love me still? Yes, then I care not, life is happy yet. Thou wilt not own thy lover's heart, sweet maid, this to the second sister, white as snow. But shall I love him? Tearfully she said. Yes, that is bliss enough for me to know. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
The Hare and the Tortoise by George Murray, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Hare and the Tortoise. The idea of the Hare and the Tortoise was suggested to me by the late George T. Lanigan. Once on a time, a memorable race between a tortoise and a hare took place. At the word "go," Puss started like the wind and left her rival hopelessly behind. But soon, reflecting that she scarce could lose, she sank to earth and coolly took a snooze. Meanwhile, the tortoise slowly plodded on, till, inch by inch, the goal was almost won. Just then the hare leaped lightly from her bed, and saw the reptile crawling far ahead. Scared by the sight, with all her speed and strength, she galloped in a winner by a length. Bravo, cried Puss, my victory serves to show the race is not gained always by the slow. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Beauty and the Beast by Pierre Jean de Baranger. Translated from the French by George Murray. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. Ye gods, how fair she is! How bright to me her beauty seems! Her eyes are full of tender light that haunts the soul in dreams. No breath of life can sweeter be than hers beneath the sky. Ye gods, how beautiful is she! But what a fright am I! Ye gods, how fair! Scarce twenty years have watched her charms unfold. Her mouth a budding rose appears, her tresses molten gold. Demure and coy she fails to see each grace that we descry. Ye gods, how beautiful is she! But what a fright am I! Ye gods, how exquisite her bloom! And yet she loves me well. For years I envied men on whom fair woman's eyes would dwell. Until I won her, love from me disdainfully would fly. Ye gods, how beautiful is she! But what a fright am I! Ye gods, she seems more charming now, for me her passion glows. Bald before thirty years, my brow to her its garland owes. My love shall now no secret be, triumphant I can die. Ye gods, how beautiful is she! But what a fright am I! End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Prologue to the Merchant of Venice by George Murray. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Prologue to the Merchant of Venice, as acted in Montreal by the late Professor Andrew's pupils. What shall I say? This nigh three hundred years since the great master of our smiles and tears shakespeare the myriad-minded artist drew his never-fading portrait of the jew immortal shylock when we speak thy name what swift emotions kindle into flame lured by the dramatist's romantic spell from the gray commonplace wherein we dwell we voyage backward up the stream of time to sea-girt venice in her golden prime and there encircled by her clustering isles round which the ocean ever sports and smiles from marble palace and from frescoed wall from mosque-like fane and statue-peopled hall we turn our gaze to where rialto's pride rears its broad arch and spans the busy tide for us one figure lives and haunts the scene in scarlet cap and threadbare gabardine ay there he stands the money-lending jew wise as a serpent and as deadly too he sees his race the chosen of the lord proscribed and spurned insulted and abhorred till in his breast inscrutable to all the milk of kindness curdles into gall antonio threatens must the threat be borne again to spit upon his beard in scorn oh for one glorious chance ere life be fled to wreak hot vengeance on the christian's head oh that he might by one tremendous deed force the whole heart of christendom to bleed it comes at last the chance for which he prayed the duke is judge the forfeit must be paid and the stern claimant whets a gleaming knife keen as his hunger for the merchant's life
we watch we tremble for antonio's fate we loathe the hebrew's unrelenting hate but still we pity and when shylock old robbed of his child his vengeance and his gold sees naught to live for in the years to come and blindly staggers to his lonely home i trow that never since the world began hath woe more tragic been beheld by man peace to such thoughts i meant at first to say more of the players than about the play but to my own astonishment i flew off at a tangent all about the jew one word kind friends whenever you think it right greet with applause the actors of to-night they're young they own it pray forgive the crime youth is a fault that disappears in time portia's sweet self is waiting at the side antonio's saviour and bassanio's bride her melting tones inimitably clear fall like soft music on the spellbound ear while pert nerissa plays a double part like giddy jessica with graceful art as for the boys those sprightly clever elves have tongues i know to answer for themselves my task is over the curtain soon will rise and shakespeare's scenes shall live before your eyes End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Villikins and His Dinah by E. L. Blanchard. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. In London's fair city, a merchant did dwell. He had but one daughter, an unkimmon nice young gal. Her name it were Dinah, just sixteen years old, with a very large portion of silver and gold as dinah was a-walking in the garden one day her papa he came to her and thus he did say go dress yourself dinah in gorgeous array for i've got you a husband both gallant and gay oh papa oh papa i've not made up my mind and to marry just yet i am not quite inclined and all my large fortune i'll gladly give o'er if you let me be single just one year or more go go boldest daughter the parent replied if you won't consent for to be this man's bride i'll give all your fortune to the nearest of kin and ye shan't reap the benefit of one single pin as villikins was a valkin in the garden one day he spied his dear dinah lying dead on the clay and a cup of cold pisen was a-lying by his side and a billet ducks to say that for villikins she died he kissed her cold corpus a thousand times o'er he called her his dinah though she were no more and swallowed the pison like a lover so brave and villikins and his dinah lie buried in one grave end of poem this recording is in the public domain idem latine reditum translated from blanchard's english by george murray read for librivox dot org by anne boulet res bene londini quanda mercator agebat unica qui proles grata puela fuit dina bees octonos wixdom comple werat annos pandus ab argenti grande petita sui forte vagabator fragrantem dina per hortem quum pater ingratos editit ore sonos wade age sic ubeo regalis in due vestes te mane igragius dina biata procas o pater alme pater mea mens incerta vacillat ni cupio thalami nescia fere jugum di vitias quante mihi sint tibi leta resignio du modo ne cogar me sociar wiro at cawe respondit pater alga kisima vergo nec mora tu conjux conjugis huis eris sin minus argento potientor proximus heris nec fuerit wili te penes asse frui forte per erabat uenis willicinsius hortum tempore quo moriens dina jacobat humi cernitor atra calix gallido mixata venio cartaque virgenius quae patet omnis amor oscula morte rigens a capit mile puela mortua sed quamvis mortua 
Dina Tamen, tum bibit impawido willila cincius ore venenium, fidaque cum fido dina sepulta yacet. End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Farewell to the Guards by George Murray. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. Brave men and true, farewell. This eve the steamship wafts you from our shore, and few who round the royal mountain dwell will see your faces more. Should this be so, the future who can read? Guardsmen, we bid you, one and all, Godspeed. Blithe summer thrice hath bloomed, since, proudly conscious of your valour's worth, what time more shadow in the distance loomed, old England sent you forth. She deemed it well to trust her western child to men whose honour never was defiled. Stern winter reigned supreme, when to our aid ye marched through dreary lands. Keen frost, deep snowdrifts, seemed a hideous dream to your enduring bands. But the warm welcome ye received at last, effaced the memory of each hardship past. Then ye were strangers, now ye are our friends, and ye have earned the name, by living lives ye need not disavow, by shunning deeds of shame. And thus, brave guardsmen, as your host departs, one feeling animates Canadian hearts, one feeling of regret, deep and unfeigned, that men by whom each day our streets were trod, to whom we owe a debt that words can never pay, will soon be sundered by the ruthless deep, from hearts that pray for them, from eyes that weep. Oft at the festal scene we shall miss faces round the social hearth, when gallant officers, whose courteous mien betokened gentle birth, no longer woo Canadian beauty's glance, breathe the soft lay or circle in the dance. But not in vain, we trust, have you bold legions dwelt within our land. Go to your English homes, since go you must, it is your queen's command. But bear away fond memories of the time that ye have sojourned in our peaceful clime. Let distant brothers know that they must dream of Canada no more as a bleak region of eternal snow, where boundless forests soar, and fur-clad settlers, whom the winter spares, wage a grim war with Indians or with bears. Dispel such idle dreams. Go tell your comrades of a fertile soil, a healthful climate and majestic streams. Tell how the sons of toil love the free country that hath still full space to nurture millions of the human race. Tell of our sea-like lakes, of village homes where peace and plenty smile, of grand St. Lawrence, our Canadian Nile, and the vast bridge that breaks the crystal boulders, mountainous and white, that winter vainly hurls against its might. And now, once more, farewell. May peace brood dove-like o'er your island home. But, oh, if e'er some rebel hordes to quell through foreign lands ye roam, may the great god of battles lend you might to vanquish England's foemen in the fight. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Silken Sashes by George Murray. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. The Turks were many, the Greeks were few, but their blood was hot and their hearts beat true, and they swear an oath before God on high, never like dastards to yield, but die. But how can a hundred champions hope, with foes eight hundred or more to cope? Death comes, however, but once to all. Why fear to die if they nobly fall? One Greek, a stripling, they sent away, and sternly bade him this charge obey. Go hide and watch till the combat ends, then bear the news to our wives and friends. At dawn they quitted the mountain glade, where each his couch on the turf had made, and down to the valley they marched, and there appeared a rampart with toilsome care. The Pacha's envoy gave curt command, Disband, ye rebels, at once disband. The chieftain answered, It is too late. Our stand is taken. We bide our fate. The silken sashes that girt them round, Long crimson sashes, had been unwound, 
and linked together, strong limb to limb, they proudly chanted a battle hymn. The onslaught followed, the heroes fell, cut down by sabre and shot and shell. But ere the lives of the hundred sped, five hundred Moslems had joined the dead. When months had passed since that bloody fray, an English colonel who rode that way saw sun-bleached skeletons strewn around, with crimson sashes together bound. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Desolation by Théophile Gautier, translated from the French by George Murray, read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. In the forest, bleak and lonely, nothing by the winds is stirred, but one withered leaflet only, and beside it pipes a bird. Everything is dead or dying, in my heart, save love alone. There it sings, but autumn's sighing drowns the music of each tone. Winter comes, the leaflet falleth, love too dies amid the gloom. Little bird, when springtime calleth, come and sing above my tomb. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Pauper Poet by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia A Pauper Poet In a vast city's swarming street Where crowds sweep wave-like on Where, if some strange, quaint sight we meet We turn and, lo, tis gone I saw a face that moved my heart That haunts my memory yet Its phantom never can depart Although but once we met I may not tell the wretchedness that glared from out its eyes, touched by its silent, sore distress, I could not check my sighs. He passed, men muttered, and I heard his life's eventful tale. What marvel if my soul was stirred, that stranger to bewail? A poet once, his magic strains through Italy had rung, and with wild music pierced the brains, and hearts of old and young. He had sung love, liberty, and light, and by some weird control had troubled, as an angel might, the waters of each soul. And now he treads the crowded street, a careworn pauper old, white-haired, ill-clad in summer's heat, ill-clad in winter's cold. Methought that Bart, bowed down and weak, was like some leafless vine, which storm-tossed on a hillside bleak, and white with snow doth pine. While the rich juice that from it ran, like song from a poet's heart, cheers, warms, and fires the souls of men in climes that oceans part. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Ballad for Christmas Tide by George Murray, read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. There is a story that hath oft my spirit deeply stirred, none ever at its words have scoffed, although so often heard. I call to mind no other tale, more fitted for the time, its pathos cannot wholly fail to consecrate my rhyme. A rich man dwelt in days of old within a palace rare. Arrayed in purple and in gold, he fed on sumptuous fare, and to his gateway there did crawl a Lazar old and sore, who begged the crumbs that chanced to fall upon the palace floor. Alas, in vain the Lazar prayed, they bade him quick be gone, in purple and in gold arrayed, still dives feasted on. Death came, and Lazarus at last with angels went to dwell, the rich man's spirit also passed away from earth to hell and thence he lifts his burning eyes in torment and unrest and sees the lazar as he lies in abraham's holy breast one drop one drop in mercy's name to cool my tongue he cried i am tormented in this flame that blessing was denied o brothers ye who riches own to starving want be just heaven counts those riches but alone a temporary trust 
there is a gulf which yawns between the wealthy and the poor and love alone that wide ravine can bridge securely o'er end of poem this recording is in the public domain the ballad of a hopeless man by henri murger translated from the french by george murray read for librivox .org by sonia the ballad of a hopeless man who knocks for entrance at this hour open who art thou first tis i thy name i cannot ope my door at midnight to a stranger's cry thy name o oh, let me in thy room the snow falls fast it blinds my sight thy name a corpse within the tomb is not more cold than i to-night for i have wandered all the day from north to south from east to west o oh, let the wanderer in i pray one moment by thy fire to rest not yet who art thou i am fame to immortality i lead hence mocking shade delusive name thy faithless voice i dare not heed o oh, hear me i am love and youth akin to heaven pass on thy way my mistress failed me in her truth love youth for me both died that day hush i am poesy and art proscribed by man quick open no be gone all music from my heart died out with love long years ago but i am wealth thou shalt not lack vast treasures of victorious gold and i can lure thy mistress back alas but not our love of old unbar thy dwelling i am power and i can throne thee as a king in vain the friends that are no more back to these arms thou canst not bring then hearken if for him alone who tells his name thy doors unclose learn that my name is death i own a balm that cures all earthly woes hark at my girdle clank the keys of gloomy vaults where sleep the dead thou too shalt slumber at thine ease for i will guard thy dreamless bed come then thou stranger pale and thin scorn not my garret's naked floor my hearth is cold but enter in i welcome thee i can no more hope's self my bosom cannot thrill and i am weary of life's cheat had but my courage matched my will this heart long since had ceased to beat come sup with me and sleep and when thy reckoning thou shalt seek to pay at morn o gentle angel then far bear me in thine arms away long for thy coming i have pined and i with joy will be thy mate but leave o oh, leave my dog behind for so one friend shall mourn my fate end of poem this recording is in the public domain a story of king david by george murray read for LibriVox.org by larry wilson first chronicles chapter 11 15 to 19 twas the harvest time and the warrior king in the cave of adullam lay weary of battles and languishing with the pitiless heat of day pale he lay as one who had died and his foes were around him on every side through a storm-rent crevice he bent his gaze upon riphium's vale below and watched in the quivering noontide blaze the tents of the heathen glow for the foeman's garrisons held each place city or hamlet that i could trace a burning fever consumed the king and he panted with keen desire for a fresh cool draught from some mountain spring while his brain seemed all on fire but rivulet near him or fount was none they had been lapped up by the fierce hot sun then he thought how his enemy slaked their thirst at the well by bethlehem's gate and a cry from his kingly bosom burst as he crouched there desolate oh the cool pure waters of bethlehem my parched lips agony pines for them is it some dream that i panting lie like a woodland beast at bay israel's anointed king am i to perish of thirst this day 
Oh, that some helpmate a draught would give of Bethlehem's water that I might live. Adino the Esnite, a stalwart chief and warrior comrades twain, heard the sick monarch's low cries of grief and vowed to assuage his pain. But for three, I ween, t'was a hopeless task to seek the boon that the king did ask. Their fleet strong coursers flew like wind, their swords like lightning flashed, as onward to jeopardy seeming blind, like angels of death they dashed, till at Bethlehem's gate, after bloody deeds, they reeled in their saddles and reined their steeds. Ice cold water they drew from the well, and soon by the same red track, while arrows and javelins rain like fell, rode gashed and gore stained back. Then they sought the craven and cried, Ho, king, water from Bethlehem's well we bring. Dizzy and feeble the king stood up to honor the mighty three, and with trembling fingers upraised the cup while its waters sparkled free. Still he would not sip one drop, but poured the blood-bought life draught to the Lord. And he spake, O Lord, be it far from me to do this sinful thing. This cup is the blood of these mighty three who were stricken to save their king. So he would not drink in his sore distress. Could a king do more or a hero less? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. At Lake Mahole by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Dedicated to Louis J. Papineau, Esquire, of Montebello Stretched on a hillside's wooded height, While with faint sigh the breezes blow, We watch the moonbeams' trembling light On Lake Mahole's breast below. Primeval mountains, grouped around, Are grown by immemorial pines, the near horizons circle bound with their black summits curving lines and all is silent as the moon the earth the waters and the sky save when some solitary loon wakes the weird echoes with a cry here where man's step hath seldom trod where a settler's axe hath never rung we muse unseen except by god each nerve to newborn rapture strung amid this solemn wilderness were sweet dear friend to dwell a while far from stern labour's daily stress too rarely solaced by a smile twere sweet who knows beneath yon lake to sink on some tempestuous night and in an after world to wake a world of unimagined light peace to such thoughts the campfire's blaze allures us to our transient home to-morrow with the sun's first rays awaking onward we will roam end of poem this recording is in the public domain from the french of victor hugo by george murray read for librivox dot org by thomas peter for a blind beggar like homer's self or Belisarius blind, by one slight girl his guardian angel led. The alms bestowed by strangers who are kind, he cannot see. God watches in his stead. Beneath a Crucifix Come to this God, ye mourners, for he weeps. Come, ye who suffer, he will heal your pain. Ye tremblers, come, his pity never sleeps. Come, all who pass, Christ waits and will remain. End of poems. This recording is in the public domain. Translations from the Odes of Horace. Translated from the Latin by George Murray. Read for LibriVox.org. Book One, Ode Twenty-Two. Fuscus, the man whose life is pure and clear from crime, may live secure. No Moorish darts or bow he needs, no quiver stored with venom reeds. Whether on Afric's burning sands, or savage Caucasus he stands, or where, with legend-haunted tide, the waters of Hedaspes glide. 
for while in sabine glades alone singing of lalage my own i roamed light-hearted and unarmed a wolf that faced me fled alarmed no monster so portentous roves through gallant daunia's broad oak groves nor e'en in juba's thirsty land that suckles lions mid the sand place me on lifeless deserts where no tree is fanned by summer's air that zone of earth which mist and cloud with sullen atmosphere enshroud set me in boundless realms afar beneath the sun's two neighboring car e'en there sweet smiling lalage sweet speaking maid beloved shall be horace to virgil on the death of quinctilius book one ode twenty four why check the yearning for a friend so loved o muse to whom belong by jove's own gift both lyre and song thy mournful inspiration lend quinctilius sleeps in endless night when shall his peer be found on earth for true unblemished modest worth and loyal faith that loves the right the good all mourned him but thy moan was saddest virgil thou in vain dost ask him of the gods again unmindful he was but alone nay couldst thou sweeter strains command than orpheus whom the groves obeyed thou couldst not animate the shade which maya's son with gloomy wand closing the gate of life hath driven to mingle with the spectral throng tis hard but suffering makes us strong to meet the unchanging will of heaven book one ode thirty seven boy i detest all persian state and crowns with linden bark entwined seek not the rose that lingers late for me to find enough this simple myrtle wreath which decks not ill thy brows and mine as served by thee i drink beneath the trellised vine book three ode twelve bandusian spring as crystal clear with flowers thy dew and pleasant wine a kid to-morrow shall be thine whose horns just budding forth appear portending love and war in vain child of the wanton flock his blood the ice-cold current of thy flood ere long with crimson hue shall stain the blazing dog-star's scorching heat doth touch thee not oh grateful thou to oxen wearied of the plough and the faint herd with wandering feet thou too ennobled shalt be found among earth's fountains while i sing thy bubbling rills that downward spring from hollow crags with ilex crowned Book two, ode ten. Life's course in safety wouldst thou steer, Licinius, shun the open deep, nor to the treacherous shore in fear of storms too closely keep. The giant pine by tempest oft is rent, towers fall with heavy crash, and mountain peaks that soar aloft attract the lightning's flash. He who selects the golden mean finds in no garret foul his home, nor covets, sober and serene, the envy stirring dome a mind well trained both hopes in woe and fears in weal a change of fate for jove who sends the cheerless snow withdraws it soon or late tears will be followed by a smile apollo with his lyre the muse oft wakens ceasing for a while his deadly bow to use when nearly wrecked in times of ill prove the brave metal of thy mind and wisely reef thy sails that fill with too propitious wind Book two, Ode fourteen. O oh, posthumous, my friend, my friend, the years glide swiftly to an end. No prayers can wrinkled age delay or death's inevitable day. Thrice yearly hecatombs of steers from Pluto's eyes can draw no tears. Sternly he holds earth's giant brood encircled with a gloomy flood, that flood which all must traverse soon all we who feed on nature's boon kings though we be exempt from toil or needy tillers of the soil what though we shun war's bloody plain and the hoarse surge of adria's main what though in autumn's sultry hour we dread the south wind's blighting power to black cocytus oozing slow and the vile danaids we must go him we must view who rolls the stone condemned eternally to groan earth home and charming wife must be abandoned and no cherished tree except the cypresses abhorred shall follow there their short-lived lord and ere thy kekubin shall seize close guarded with a hundred keys and revelry thy floor shall stain with choicer wine than pontiff strain
End of section. This recording is in the public domain. For Valor by George Murray. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. Hector Lachlan Stuart MacLean, a beau sabreur in swat campaign, will never brandish his sword again. Boldly he charged with some troopers brave, and hissing bullets they faced to save a fogart friend from a bloody grave. They grasped his body and swiftly turned. MacLean, sore wounded, in spirit burned. The cross for valor their deed had earned. Death claimed his prey. In the next gazette his name was honoured, with keen regret that he died ere his country could pay her debt, and thus, by laying his young life down to save a comrade, he won renown. His cross he missed, but he gained his crown. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Doves by Théophile Gautier Translated from French by George Murray. Read for LibriVox.org. On yonder hillside, white with tombs, a palm tree's fan like foliage blooms. There in the gloaming flock the doves to rest their wings and coo their loves. At dawn the palm tree they forsake, like beads that from a necklace break, and scatter airily in flight upon some distant roof to light. My soul doth like that palm tree receive white dreams as visitors at eve they drop from heaven a while they stay but vanish at the break of day end of poem this recording is in the public domain night toggenburg by friedrich schiller translated from the german by george murray read for LibriVox.org by sonia Knight Toggenburg Sir Knight, true sister love, this heart devotes to thee. No fonder seek to prove, for, oh, it paineth me. Calmly I see thee near, calmly I see thee go, but why that silent tear is wept I may not know. By dumb despair oppressed, the warrior's heart was wrung. He strained her to his breast, then on his charger sprung and summoned vessels brave forth from the Switzer's land, and sought the holy grave with Red Cross pilgrim band. There deeds of daring might were wrought by heroes' arms, their helmet plumes waved bright amid the Paynim swarms, and Toggenburg's dread name struck terror to the foe, but still no solace came to soothe his lonely woe. One year he now hath pined, why longer should he stay? Repose he cannot find amid the host's array. A bark from Joppa's strand sail gentle gales beneath. He seeks the hallowed land where floats her balmy breath. And soon a pilgrim, one, knocks at her castle gate and hears, O oh, lonely man, the thunder word of fate. The maid thou seekest now is heaven's unspotted bride. By yester morning's vow, to God himself allied. This past, he quits for a his old ancestral home, his arms with rust decay, his steeds at pleasure roam. Down from his natal crags, unknown to all, he hies, a hermit's sackcloth rags, his noble limbs disguise. He rears a lowly hut near scenes endeared by love, where frowns her convent shut, mid shade of linden grove and in that lonesome place he sate from dawn of day with hope upon his face till evening's latest ray watching with earnest hope the convent walls above to mark a lattice ope the lattice of his love to see but once her face so meek and angel mild low bending down to gaze upon the valley wild and then he sought repose consoled by visions bright nor thought upon his woes at sweet return of light and thus he sate alone long dream-like days and years waiting without a moan until the maid appears waiting to see her face so meek and angel mild 
low bending down to gaze upon the valley wild and so he sate in death one summer morning there still watching from beneath with fond calm wistful stare end of poem this recording is in the public domain a coup d'etat an incident in the night of december fourth eighteen fifty one by victor hugo translated from the french by george murray read for liverbox dot org by thomas peter the child received two bullets in the brain we bore him home the house was small and plain on the bare wall there hung a portrait dressed with a green palm branch that a priest had blessed the aged grandmother was there alone she kissed the victim with a piteous moan in silence we uncovered every limb his lips were open and his eyes were dim and while his arms drooped listless to the ground a wooden top within his frock we found deep were the wounds from which we wiped the blood hast thou seen berries bleeding in a wood his skull was cloven as a log is split the woman watched us as we tended it crying how white he is bring near the lamp god the poor curls around his brow are damp when all was done she took him on her knees the night was dreary borne upon the breeze gunshots were heard that told of many dead come let us bury the dear child we said and from an antique chest we drew a sheet but still the grandam strove to gather heat in his stiff limbs beside the embers warm alas when death's cold fingers touch a form all earthly warmth is vain she bent her head drew off her socks scarce sure that he was dead and while his feet she fondled in her hand she said these things are hard to understand monsieur the child was only eight years old and all his teachers loved him i am told when some chance letter reached me from a friend the boy would write but this is at an end they kill the children now it seems mon dieu men have turned brigands then can this be true before our window there he played at morn to-night my darling from my life is torn they fired upon him monsieur in the street while he was passing he so good and sweet but i am old i have not long to stay would god that monsieur bonaparte to-day had bid his soldiers kill me not the child here she ceased speaking for her sobs grew wild soon she continued with pathetic tone what will become of me now left alone explain me that kind gentleman i had naught from his mother but this little lad why did they kill him can you tell me speak he never shouted vive la république silent and grave we stood with brows all bare trembling before the sorrow of despair thou hast no head for politics poor dame monsieur napoleon so the man i name is prince and pauper and he fain would own unbounded wealth a palace and a throne hence wrinkled hands to sate his lust for gold must sew the shrouds of children eight years old end of poem this recording is in the public domain an old song of a youthful time by victor hugo translated from the french by george murray read for librivox dot org by thomas peter i went for a woodland walk with rose whom i heeded not twas in old old times our talk was of trifles long forgot i was marble cold and shy as i roamed with listless strides we babbled of flowers her eyes seemed to ask is there not besides the dewdrops hung like pearls on the copse of shady dales i listened i to the merles and rose to the nightingales i was sixteen sans coeur she twenty blithe and free the nightingale sang to her and the blackbirds whistled at me with white arms raised she stood stretched to her utmost height to pluck some fruit in the wood i saw not her arms so white 
a streamlet fresh and deep over velvet mosses strayed and nature seemed to sleep in the grand wood's solemn shade rose lifted her robe of white and dipped with an innocent air her naked foot in the wavelet bright i saw not her foot so fair we roamed in the woods long while but never a word spake i though i saw her sometimes smile and heard her sometimes sigh i felt not how fair that maid till we left the deep woodland glen amen we won't think of it more she said i have thought of it oft since then end of poem this recording is in the public domain margaret's song by johann wolfgang von goethe translated from the german by george murray read for LibriVox.org. in thule lived a monarch old true even to the grave to whom a goblet wrought of gold his dying leman gave and not more richly did he prize at every feast twas drained and often as he quaffed his eyes with tears o'er brimming rained and when his death drew nigh with care he counts his cities up no wealth begrudging to his heir except the golden cup a solemn feast he held with all his knights as company twas in his proud ancestral hall that hung above the sea there stood that king carouser old his last life draught to drain then hurled the treasured cup of gold far down into the main he saw it splash it filled it sank deep deep the waves beneath with downcast eyes he watched nor drank one drop again till death end of poem this recording is in the public domain the wandering jew by pierre jean de beranger Translated from the French by George Murray. Read for LibriVox.org. Christian, a cup of water fetch for the faint pilgrim at thy gate. I am the wandering Jew, poor wretch, world onwards evermore by fate. I age not, though by years oppressed, the world's end is my only dream. Each eve fresh hopes inspire my breast, but still to-morrow's sun will beam. Ever, ever the earth spins round and resteth never, never never for eighteen hundred years alas or grecian and or roman dust or countless empires quenched i pass by fearful whirlwinds onward thrust good i have seen that failed to thrive while lustier evil throve and grew and i have watched two worlds survive the ancient world from ocean's blue ever ever the earth spins round and resteth never 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 God changed me, that he might chastise. To all that perishes I cling, but when some shelter open lies, the tempest sweeps me on its wing. How many starvelings in each land ask aid that I would fain supply! They have no time to clasp the hand I love to stretch while passing by. Ever, ever, the earth spins round and resteth never, never, never. If e'er beneath some leafy trees, on cool green turf, beside the wave, I seek my wretchedness to ease, forthwith the vengeful whirlwinds rave. Oh, why should heaven begrudge my grief a fleeting moment of repose? Eternity itself were brief to soothe my agonizing woes. Ever, ever, the earth spins round and resteth never, never, never. How oft have children, pure and bright, called up the phantoms of mine own! But while I feast upon the sight, on by the whirlwind I am blown. O aged mortals, wherefore lust that age may be prolonged a while? My weary foot shall stir the dust of those sweet babes on whom I smile. Ever, ever, the earth spins round and resteth never, never, never. I scan dim traces of the home where ages since I had my birth. The whirlwind mutters, onward, roam. Thy steps must traverse all the earth. Such is the penance for thy sin, Till the spent universe expires. For thee no place is kept within, The crumbling vault that holds thy sires. Ever, ever, the earth spins round, And resteth never, never, never. 
I taunted with inhuman jest the man-god as he breathed his last. Since then my feet have had no rest. Farewell, I travel with the blast. Ye who sweet charity disown, behold my pain that none can cure. Tis not for godhead scorned alone, but outraged manhood I endure. Ever, ever, the earth spins round and resteth never, never, never. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Avenged Crow by George Murray, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Avenged Crow, imitated from the French. You have all heard the tale of the fox and the crow, but the sequel I fancy that few people know. Permit me to tell the denouement, for I was a witness, alas, of poor Renard's last sigh. His papa, his mamma, and the nearest of kin who kissed his cold muzzle were filled with chagrin when the doctor called in to determine the question pronounced his death caused by severe indigestion my friends said papa this deplorable case will brand us i fear as a gluttonous race twill be said this dear child whom we idolized so died from eating the cheese of that imbecile crow all groaned at these words the dead gourmand next morn in a hearse with white plumes to the graveyard was borne the foxes in black some three hundred in all walked two and two chanting the dead march in saul when they stood round the pit they again groaned aloud and the mayor made a heart-rending speech to the crowd what he said i don't know but of this there's no doubt that each fox held a handkerchief up to his snout just then madame crow perched hard by on a tree, croaked, Renard is dead, what a grand day for me. He sneered at my singing and pilfered my cheese. In return, he lies there, carried off by disease. Moral The moral is this. When we rob friend or foe, it seldom brings weal, but it often brings woe. Had Renard not been an inordinate thief, dyspepsia would never have brought him to grief. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Landlady's Daughter by Ludwig Uhland. Translated from the German by George Murray. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. Three students over the Rhine have hied. To the inn of a hostess they turn aside. Say, hostess, hast thou good beer and wine, and where is that lovely daughter of thine? My wine and ale are both bright and clear, my daughter lies shrouded upon her bier. Softly they entered her sleeping room, and there she lay in the coffin's gloom. The first he lifted the maiden's veil, and sadly gazed on her features pale. Would thou wert living, O fairest maid, I would love thee dearly henceforth. He said. The second covered her face again, and turned aside to shed tears like rain. Ah, me! Thou art lying upon thy bier, thou whom I cherished for many a year. The third uplifted once more the veil, and kissed the maid on the lips so pale. I love thee now as I loved before, I will love thee fondly for evermore. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Two Pictures by N. Martin Translated from the French by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Two Pictures The Bird of Gloom High on a snow-clad branch a gloomy bird sat, silent as despair, and never stirred. Upon the desolate earth are fixed his eyes, In the lone glen perchance he marks a prize. Or is he dead? Not so. He strippeth bare the snow-clad bough, And wets his beak with care, Then sails away on weary wing, And then drops where yon sexton digs the graves of men. The Bird of Light A bird sat piping upon a spray, 
all silvered over with blossoms gay his crimson plumage was wondrous bright he seemed to have flown from the realms of light so clear a voice from his throat did pass the charmed soul rang to it like a glass he sang such paeans of victory that the hearts of all men with hope beat high he is dead that bird of my golden days oh would that again i might hear his lays end of poem this recording is in the public domain consolation by alfred du musset translated from the french by george murray read for LibriVox.org by thomas peter poor restless mortal creature of a day why dost thou mourn who wakes thy plaintive sigh what though thy soul be sorrow's tearful prey that soul is deathless and thy tears will dry thou art the victim of some woman's whim thy heart is crushed by one who cannot feel thou seekest god imploring aid from him thy soul is deathless and thy heart will heal thou sayest unmanned by transitory sorrow the past conceals the future from thy sight weep not for yesterday await to-morrow thy soul is deathless time pursues his flight thy body faints beneath thy spirit's woe thy limbs are feeble and thy brow doth bend go kneel in prayer insensate creature go thy soul is deathless life will quickly end thy bones to dust shall crumble in the bier thy memory name and glory all must die but not thy love if love to thee be dear twill live for ever with thy soul on high end of poem this recording is in the public domain a handful of epigrams translated from french by george murray read for LibriVox.org. With perfect ease, a scribbler cried, I pour my verses forth. They cost me not, a friend replied, they cost you what they're worth. De Marcy. Silence in court, a judge harangued. This noise is quite absurd. Five men I've sentenced to be hanged, whose pleas I haven't heard. Baritone. Greece, that produced a warrior host, renowned in all our schools, could but a seven sages boast, who then can count her fools. Grecourt. This playwright, arrogant and mean, is wont his friends to tell. He has the secret of Racine, he keeps the secret well. Arnaud. A bard, whose name I won't disclose, asserted once with pride, I never deign to write in prose. His verses prove he lied. Voltaire. Stab as you will with venomed quill the living and the dead. Few will abuse your jealous muse because she seldom read. Cocard. My friend, you thought me stupid once because I scarcely spoke. I thought you too an empty dunce whenever you silence broke. Linares. End of a handful of epigrams. This recording is in the public domain. Beneath a Picture by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Beneath a Picture Fearfully gazing spirit, Wherefore lies that strange sad speculation in thine eyes? Why dost thou shrink, as though beneath a storm shedding the brightness of thine angel form art thou a rebel spirit didst thou fling proud threats of old at heaven's eternal king and crushed and vanquished wilt thou soon be hurled down by the victor to a demon world it cannot be thou art not one of those doomed to a dark eternity of woes who gnash their teeth in frenzied pain and weep and vainly pray for everlasting sleep no thou art spotless all thy sins are dead a wreath of glory streams around thy head and if thy countenance is pale and wan 
tis that thy love is shown in fear for man yea fear hath cast a shade upon thy soul for worlds are shrinking like a shriveled scroll and all things pass away and angels gaze with dim intelligence and strange amaze on shadowy forms upfloating from the earth roused by the trumpet to a second birth swiftly they soar as eagles over a cloud souls from all climes a voiceless troubled crowd sinners and saints the monarch and the slave bursting at once the bondage of the grave perhaps amid those sinners there is one whom thou dost recognize an only son for whom sad prayers were offered up above by the deep fondness of a deathless love who cold and senseless as earth's meanest clod died as he lived the enemy of god and he the loved the lost one cometh now with sin's dark curse deep branded on his brow therefore it is with reason that there lies that strange sad speculation in thine eyes therefore thou shrinkest as beneath a storm shrouding the brightness of thine angel form end of poem this recording is in the public domain the caravan by theophile gautier translated from the french by george murray read for LibriVox.org by thomas peter amid the world's sahara by the path of doleful years that no man can retrace the human caravan toils slowly on quenching its thirst with bloody sweat alone the lion roars the tempest raves and still no tower or dome or minaret in sight forward the dim horizon seems to fly high o'er our heads the vulture scents his prey his ghastly shadow is our only shade while on we stagger till our languid eyes fall on a far-off lonely spot of green a grove of cypress dotted with white stones god in his mercy on the sands of time hath dropped one oasis the cemetery lie down poor breathless pilgrims sleep at last End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Fame and Love by Victor Hugo Translated from the French by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter When, dearest, thou dost speak of fame, With bitterness I smile, That phantom, a delusive name, shall me no more beguile fame passes quickly from our ken pale enemies blazing brands spare its white statue only when beside a tomb it stands earth's so-called happiness takes wing imperial power decays love noiseless love alone can bring true solace to our days i ask no blessings here below except thy smile and song air sunshine shade the flowers that blow to all mankind belong when from thy presence thundered far in joy or sorrow's hour i miss thy glance alone my star thy fragrance o oh my flower beneath the lids that veil thine eyes illumined from above a universe of feeling lies i seek for naught but love my soul that poesy inspires with thoughts to man unknown could fill the world yet it desires to fill thy heart alone o oh, smile and sing my ecstasy transcends elysian joys what matters now yon crowd to me with all its roaring noise too keen at length my rapture seems and so to cause its flight i call before me in my dreams the poet's forms of light but still regardless of their blame i love thy soothing songs more than the stirring trump of fame while heaven my life prolongs and if my name on wings of fire should soar to worlds above half my soul would still desire to linger here and love sadly or pensively at least i love thee in the shade love's radiance ever seems increased 
by dusky twilight's aid. O angel with the starry eyes, O maid whose tears are sweet, Take my soul with thee to the skies, My heart is at thy feet. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Spectre of the Rose by Théophile Gautier Translated from the French by George Murray Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia The Spectre of the Rose Those marble-lidded eyes unclose Wake from thy sleep's angelic trance I am the spectre of a rose That decked thy beauty in the dance Thy fingers plucked me from my stem Wet with the dews of yester even And thou didst wear me like a gem Amid the ballroom's dazzling scene. My life's brief summer thou didst blight, My ghost away thou canst not chase, Twill flit untiring all the night Around thy softly pillowed face. I claim no masses for my death, No de profundis slowly wailed, My spirit is a fragrant breath From paradise itself exhaled. Torn from the world, I did not sigh, nor could thy fondest lovers crave a happier death than mine to die. Thy snow-white bosom was my grave, and on that alabaster tomb a poet wrote with loving kiss, Here lies a rose whose early doom even kings might envy for its bliss. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.